Welcome to today's episode of the Mindset Mentor Podcast. I am your host, Rob Dial, and if you have not yet done so, hit that subscribe button so that you never miss another episode of this podcast. This might seem weird and woo-woo-y, and I completely understand that because I'm a very logical, sensible person. But when I go through this, and I'm very analytical as well, you're going to see what I mean by how the law of attraction works, whether you happen to be woo-woo-y or whether you happen to be a very analytical, science-based type person, this is gonna make sense to you no matter which one you are. And I'm gonna teach you how to use the law of attraction to get what it is that you want in your life. Now, I'll tell you this, I've been using it now for about 15 years, and I can tell you this, no matter what your stance is on the law of attraction, it works. If you take notes on this, if you use it, I'm going to teach you how it works, how to use it in your life, and how to get what you want in life as well. On a basic sense, this is what the law of attraction says. It says that you can attract anything that you want into your life, but you need to believe in it to your core. And if you believe in it to your core, every single cell in your body, then you will get whatever that thing is. But that's the secret to it, is that you have, to, you, have, you have 50 trillion cells in your body right now, right? You have to get all of those cells to go towards that one thing. And the way that you control your 50 trillion cells is through the central voice, your thoughts. And that's what we're gonna go into. I'm gonna go much more in depth, but basically you will attract into your life what you think about the most. That's the easiest way to think of the law of attraction, but we're gonna go much more in depth than just that alone. Now, you may have seen the movie, The Secret. The Secret is on the law of attraction. I think it's a great movie. It's a great book, but I think it leaves a lot out. The way that The Secret seems to be for me is I'm going to sit down. I'm going to figure out what it is that I want. I'm going to sit there. and I'm going to think about it all day long. And it's just going to the universe is just going to bring it into my life. And I think that that's part of it, but it's missing a lot. And that's what I want to dive into. And there's no real explanation of how it works. So it makes it a lot easier to believe in something when you know exactly how it works, because then you go, okay, yeah, I can get behind this idea. You know, you can't just sit there and just meditate the rest of your life and try to meditate a million dollars into your bank account without actually getting up and doing something, right? So it requires you to, yes, the law of attraction, but also it requires action. You got to do something. So we're going to dive into that. And to understand the law of attraction, we must understand our bodies as they are. Our bodies are molecular structures that are vibrating at a massive speed at all points in time. So you can look at my hand and my hand seems like a solid object, but my hand is not solid. It is actually vibrating. If you were to be able to look at my hand through a microscope, you're able to see all of the trillions of cells in my body, all of them moving at a specific rate, whatever that is. If you look at anything that you can see in your physical reality, everything is a vibrating structure. My desk, this podcasting mic, the camera this is recording it on, my computer that's recording this audio, everything is vibrating. It's just that everything is vibrating at different speeds. And we're constantly vibrating. Everything is. The difference between my body and my desk though, is that my desk is one constant speed, one constant vibration. My body, changes depending on my thoughts and my feelings. So, you know, I'll give you a perfect example of, of, of how this is going to make sense to you. Have you ever walked up to somebody and you just have a bad feeling around that person? Like there's just a feeling of something's not right, right? That is your body's vibration and their body's vibration coming into contact with each other. And they're not in alignment in some sort of way. That's called destructive interference. If you want to go deeper into it, right? But have you ever met somebody before and you don't know why, but you just connect to them and you get an incredible feeling around them? That is my body and their body, their fields coming together. I know it sounds weird. I get it for those guys that are analytical. Our fields coming together because your, your vibration of your body doesn't just stay within your skin, right? So we are in alignment. If I'm vibrating at a certain rate and that person's vibrating at a certain rate, I'm going to have good feelings. That's where the phrase good vibes come from. That's also where the phrase bad vibes come from. As you can tell whether something's right or right, wrong, you can tell whether someone is right or wrong based on how basically how you feel. Now, in order to understand how the law of attraction works, we must understand two separate things. Number one is our conscious mind, which is the mind that you hold all of your thoughts in. And the other one is then your subconscious mind. So we're going to get really deep today. I hope you're ready, right? Your conscious mind is the mind in which you think, right? Your conscious mind is only about 5% of your thoughts throughout the day, right? Everything you think about, and you can only hold one thought at a time. Your subconscious mind is like your mind's filing cabinet. 
It doesn't know this is true, this is false. It just takes all of the information and stores it all away as if all of it is true. It doesn't decipher the information, doesn't think about it, any of that stuff. But what's interesting is that your subconscious is in control of about 95% of your thoughts, your feelings, and the way that you see the world as well. So it's really important before we dive into the law of attraction a little bit more in depth is to actually understand the way your subconscious mind, which nobody tends to talk about when they talk about the secret and they talk about the law of attraction, how your subconscious mind actually dictates the law of attraction and what rate you're vibrating at. Now, you have to realize this. The subconscious mind, once again, just takes everything that you say and automatically stores it as true. So if you talk negatively about yourself in your head, if you talk trash to yourself, say, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid, then it's automatically going to take that conscious thought stored in the subconscious as true. So if you constantly just keep thinking this and thinking this and thinking this, that thought of I'm stupid over and over and over again now becomes a personality trait of somebody who is stupid. And now you actually believe at your core that you're stupid. If you think, oh, I'll never attract the right man or I'll never attract the right woman or, you know, all guys are players or any of those types of things, those thoughts will then store into your subconscious and you will take actions that line up with what your subconscious believes in. So after years and years and years of thoughts being away, being stored away from your conscious to your subconscious, you will develop a paradigm. A paradigm is what you believe is true. And it's usually in the subconscious, so you don't even think about it. It has shaped your life throughout the years. This, your program from your childhood is where your paradigm, your, that's actually what dictates what your paradigm is going to be. So if your paradigm is a, is a child, um, if it shapes the way that you view the world as an adult, it's everything. It's what you believe, it's what you don't believe, it's what you love, it's what you hate, it's the language you speak, if you believe in yourself, if you don't believe in yourself, if you talk down to yourself, if you're rich and successful now, if you're poor now, if you ever will be rich and successful, if you'll continue to fail in relationships, if you have you know, a successful one, the way that you raise your kids, your paradigm literally dictates everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that you feel, everything your conscious mind, everything your subconscious mind, it dictates everything. So let me give you an example. If you were born poor as a kid, right, and your parents always got in fights about money and your parents were always in debt. And they said stuff like money doesn't grow on trees and money's the root of all evil. And you know, in order to be rich and successful, you have to screw people over. Then your brain's going to take that and take that and take that and take that. And then it's going to consciously store it into your subconscious. And now you've got a paradigm just around money itself of, I have to screw people over. I'm never going to be rich and successful. You know, um, I have to do bad things to make money. Money's the root of all evil. Money doesn't grow on trees. Now I've got a paradigm around money, which is going to change my perception of the view of money of the world. It's going to change my thoughts around money. It's going to change my vibration around money. And it's going to dictate the way that I either attract money or don't attract money or the actions that I take to go make money or the actions I take not to make money. So if you're poor now, as an example, if you're rich now, as an example, if you're good in relationships now, if you're bad in relationships, all of those are guided by your paradigm. And those were all programmed into you at some point in time when you were a kid. Now, that being said, when we're looking at the programming, we're looking at the conscious and the subconscious mind, we're looking at the paradigm, it's not something that you can just change overnight. It's not just something that happens quick and easy. It takes time, but believe me, it's worth putting time into and to actually start figuring these things out right so ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to in its simplest form we're trying to affect and change all of the results that we have in our life we're trying to affect our our and change all of the results around our money making more money if we want our relationships having better relationships our happiness our joy our success everything and it all starts with what you think right and what you think whether it's good or whether it's bad goes into your subconscious and will eventually produce whatever re results you want in your life now if you want to change your results you're going to have to change your thinking right and all of your results typically line up with your paradigm so let me give you an example there's gonna be a lot i promise you i told you this is gonna be a big this can be a rich episode just so you know do you know somebody who has all of the education in the world they have you know, degrees falling off the walls and they're getting another degree and another degree and another MBA and all this stuff, but they just can't seem to succeed. They just can't seem to figure it out. Do you know anybody like that? Have you ever heard of someone like that? Why do you think that is? Because they think that education is going to change them. 
but it's not. What actually changes and needs to change is their paradigm because they can get all of the education they want to in the world, but their paradigm hasn't, hasn't changed. Now, what does this have to do with the law of attraction? Your paradigm is in control of the frequency of vibration that you set off into the world, the frequency and the vibration that your body is at. So in order to change your vibration, you must change your frequency. In order to change your frequency, you have to understand how your programming works, how your paradigm works, and what is stored inside of your subconscious. And when I say change your frequency and your vibration, the easiest way to think of it is this. You know, if I'm inside of my car and I'm going for a drive and I have the AM station turned on in my car, my car will never pick up an FM station if I am tuned into an AM station, right? It won't happen because I'm in an AM station, not an FM station. So the same thing happens where if the law of attraction, the way that it works, if I have a poverty mindset, if I have a poverty paradigm, if my subconscious is being run by you know, these poverty thoughts and money's the root of all evil, you have to screw people over and you have to work all day in order to become successful. If I have that poverty mindset, then I'm going to send that, it's, it's in my thoughts, it's in my body, I'm vibrating in a poverty mindset frequency, I'm gonna send that out into the world, right? So an example of that would be all of the people, places, opportunities, and things that could get me out of my poverty mindset, I won't even notice them. Why? Because if someone comes in that could change my, or an opportunity comes in that says, oh, this could get me out of my poverty mindset, I'm not even going to recognize that it's something that could help me. I'm automatically going to push it away the same way that if I meet somebody and I'm not vibrating at the same frequency as them, I'm going to get bad vibes. So for instance, I might have a poverty mindset and the best freaking investment opportunity or the best business idea can come into my awareness, can come into my field, can come into my, you know, I can literally be sitting there and talking to somebody who's got the best business investment that can make me millions of dollars. If I'm vibrating as a, at, a, at a negative, you know, poverty mindset, I'm not even going to take that thing as an option. I'm going to be like, no, this isn't right. It doesn't feel right, which is usually how you can tell, you know, the frequency. It doesn't feel right. Why? Because I'm vibrating in poverty. If abundance in, in wealth comes into my life and starts to vibrate, I'm not going to be in line with it. There's going to be a part of my body that says, no, Rob, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Therefore, I will reject that person. I will reject the opportunity. I will reject everything around me that could get me into my abundance, that could get me into my wealth because I am at a poverty mindset. Make sense? If I'm vibrating at that frequency of poverty, then anything that's not lined up with that poverty, I'm going to reject. It's crazy, isn't it? You know, so what happens is we have to get ourselves on a quote unquote money making frequency. We have to realize that our programming of money's the root of all evil and you know, you have to screw people over. Whatever it is that is your 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 frequency, the station that you're turned into, the same way that if I'm on an AM station, I won't be able to pick up an FM station. If I'm on a poverty frequency, I'm not gonna be able to pick up an abundance frequency or a wealth frequency. It's simple. It makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? Remember. The difference between myself and my desk is that we're both vibrating, but I can change my, my vibration. I can change my frequency. I can change the station that I'm turned into, right? So you will attract whatever vibration or station that you're turned into. And you can only listen to that one station. So if I'm on a poverty mindset, I won't be able to, poverty station, I won't be able to get the abundance and, you know, abundance and in, in wealth frequency if I'm on the scarcity one. Let's go to another one. If you've been screwed over, maybe, you're, maybe your parents divorced when you were younger and your mom talked about how all men screw you over and men are cheaters and don't trust men or you heard her, maybe she even say it directly to you. Maybe you overheard her talking to friends about it, right? And then you grow up and you get into a relationship and maybe you get cheated on. You're like, oh my God, my mom was right. You start to actually think so many times over and over and over and over and over again, men are cheaters, men will screw you over, you can't trust men. You know, this is just an example. It could go the other way for men to women, women to men. And you keep repeating that thing over and over and over inside of your head. What's going to happen is you are eventually going to, to create a paradigm around that. You're going to go from your, take it from your conscious thoughts, store it into your subconscious mind, which is going to change the frequency that you're vibrating at. And that's why so many people are like, I don't know why I keep dating men that are broken. I don't know why I keep dating men that are assholes. I don't know why I keep finding people who are screwing me over, who cheat on me, all of this stuff. It's because we tend to attract into our life, whatever it is that is going to line up with what we believe is true. 
in our conscious mind, in our subconscious mind, in our paradigm. We are going to attract those things into our life. So if we, even if we consciously, even if you're a woman out there or even a man out there that just wants a, a really good man, you're still going to attract the ones that are not good for you if you're always vibrating at the frequency of men will screw you over. Same way for men, for women, for all of this stuff. You know, you can switch out all of the genders in any way that you want to. It just makes sense though, doesn't it? So the same example, if I'm a, a woman who wants a really good man, but I've been screwed over and my mom said things when I was younger, when a really good man comes into my life, I won't even vibe with them or be attracted to them in any sort of way because they don't line up with the reality of the way that I see the world. I'm only going to be attracted to the people who reinforce my paradigm of the way that I see the world. So that's why, you know, someone comes in, they could be really good for them. And you're like, why don't you see your friend maybe? And you're just like, why doesn't she like him? Like he's perfect for her. Why? Because he, as a really good man, doesn't reinforce her belief paradigm consciously and subconsciously of the world of men are assholes, men screw you over, men are cheaters. Why does she always end up with those types of people? Because that's what she believes at a, in a, a, a thought and at a cellular level that men actually are. This is what meditation's for. This is what going out and actually becoming aware of these things is for, is so you can start to reprogram yourself. You realize, what station am I tuned into? What station are you tuned into? In your relationships, in your wealth, in your business, in your life, in your thinking about yourself, what station are you tuned into? Because whatever station, if I'm tuned into 98.7 FM, I'm only going to get 98.7 FM. I'm not going to get 710 AM if I'm tuned into 98.7 FM. So I've got to pay attention to, man, what do I actually consciously and subconsciously think is true about money, about business, about relationships, about wealth, about happiness, about abundance, about scarcity, all of these things, because that's going to dictate where my body is vibrating at. And if something vibes with me, which is usually going to, you know, that's called uh, constructive interference versus destructive interference then I'm going to actually understand that I'm only noticing and attracting things into my life that line up with the way that I actually truthfully, deep down at a cellular level, believe the, will, the way that the world is. So that's why you can consciously want success, but then you're not taking any action. That's why you can consciously want to have the best relationship, but you're screwing them all up or finding the wrong person. That's why you can consciously want to have a successful business, but you're freaking sleeping in and you're bringing the wrong business partners in. And all of these things are happening is because you have to become aware, not only just of your conscious thoughts, but of your subconscious thoughts and your paradigm around all of that, because that's 95% of what you think about. And it doesn't happen overnight. Like I can't just go, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm gonna change my frequency and I'm just a different person. You know, you can try to work on it every single day, but you have to res you have to literally brainwash yourself into believing that. That's why I have an episode, you know, that's, you know, brainwash your, uh, your way to success, or you have to brainwash yourself to change your paradigm. And that's brainwash yourself to be successful. That episode that I did, talks about how you have to spend every single moment, every downtime brainwashing yourself with what it is that you actually truly want to do in this world. So if you don't see results right away, it's not a big deal. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Just realize it takes time for you to reprogram yourself. If you're 35 years old, you've got 35 years of programming. It might take more than a couple weeks to start to switch your programming, start to switch your paradigm. And remember that we're all programmed from a young age. So our, our, our job now as adults is to go back, look at what our, par our paradigm is, look at what our programming was from a young age, ask ourselves, does that line up with the future that I want for myself? And if it doesn't, then I need to consciously change it and also subconsciously change it because my, it starts with my thoughts, which is my conscious mind. They're stored into my subconscious mind. That changes my vibration, which then changes what I attract in my life. That's why if I have a poverty mindset, once again, and a great business opportunity, opportunity comes into my awareness, comes into my life, I will be like, no, it just doesn't feel right. It, it's not that it doesn't feel right because it's not right for you. It doesn't feel right because it's actually not vibrationally matching where you are. It's too freaking abundant for you for where you are right now. So if you want something in your life, are you tuned into it? Think about that for a second. If I want something in my life, I need to be tuned into that freaking thing. If you want something in your life, are you tuned into that station? 
if you want something in your life, you need to be tuned into that, st that, that station so that you can start attracting it into your life. You know, the one thing that I don't like about the secret is that it acts like, you know what, I, if I want to have the best relationship in the world and attract the best man or the best woman into my life, I need to sit there and I need to meditate it into my life and meditate and meditate and meditate. And eventually that man will just show up at my door. No, you have to literally after working on yourself, after working on the programming, after diving into what your paradigm is, you have to get off your ass and actually take action. The, the man of your dreams or the woman of your dreams is not going to come knocking on your door while you're meditating and you're just going to attract him or her into your life. The missing piece a lot of times is that you have to actually get up and take action. Okay, I'm going to program my thoughts, my feelings, which is my head, my heart, my body to go and find this person that I want or to find that wealth that I want or to find whatever it is that I want. And then I'm going to get my physical vibrating body and put it out into the world to be able to actually go find these things. That's what I always find is missing when people talk about the law of attraction is what I like to call the law of action. You got to get your ass up and get moving. You got to do something. You got your mind, you're working on your mind, but is your body out there in the actual physical universe going where you can talk to other people of the opposite sex, right? around people who happen to have the business that you want. So if I want to attract the perfect woman into my life, right? And, uh, and I'm sitting there, if, if you're out there, you're a single guy and you're like, I want to attract the perfect woman. I'm just ready to, I'm ready to stop playing games. I want to attract her. If you're, that's what you're thinking, right? You can meditate on her all day long, but she's not going to come knocking at your door. So you got to meditate, meditate, you know, get the vibration. How do you feel about it? Are you starting to actually feel that maybe a real relationship is something that you're you're gonna settle into like is your body at that vibrational frequency and, and it sounds weird i understand the vibrational frequency and all that stuff but you can ask yourself do i feel ready to attract the right person do i feel ready to bring in the right person into my life and you can feel in your body the relaxed state that it can get into then your physical body you've actually got to leave your house right you've got to leave your house and go to places where you think that person might be and what happens is whether you realize it or not, the same way that you're vibing with somebody, they also need to be vibing with you. So you might might find somebody right now and they might be the perfect person for you, but because you haven't changed your vibrational frequency, to them, it doesn't feel right. So if you work on yourself, that's why they always say, if you wanna, if you wanna find the perfect person, become that perfect person first, because then you're going to match them vibrationally and then it's going to be good vibes between the two of you. Constructive interference versus destructive interference, aka bad vibes. So you can't just meditate that person into your life, right? Same way that if you want to have a million dollars in your bank account, you need to program and consciously think about this money that you want to make. And you've got to consciously brainwash yourself into believing that this is actually true. But then you've also got to get out and go make the money. The money's not just going to show up and you're not going to just, you know, ding dong, FedEx is here at your bank, you know, or is, that your, is that your front door and they just drop a million dollars in cash. No, you've got to physically and mentally work on yourself so that your vibration is at the right frequency so that therefore you go out and when the right opportunity or person or place or thing comes into your life, you go, that's it right there. That's the thing that I was working for. It, and it might not, you might not think it's right, but it actually feels right. The reason why it feels right is because your vibration is lining up with that vibration. So when they say attract things into your life with the law of attraction, this is what it's talking about. What you think about will be stored into your subconscious. Your subconscious will change your vibration. That vibration is at a certain frequency and you will only line up and get things that line up with that, you know, only get things that line up with that, that frequency. If you think you're going to be poor your whole life, you're going to be poor your whole life. If you think you're going to be wealthy to at a cellular level, deep down, you'll eventually be wealthy. It's going to come to you. If you think that people are always there to screw you over and that men are the, are going to screw you over and cheat on you, then you're going to find a lot of those people because those people line up with the reality, line up with the frequency that you're vibrating at. You're going to find only those people. But if you switch it around and you truly believe that the right person for you is out there, as long as you get yourself out there, that person is going to find you. You're going to find them. And when you do find, you're going to match vibrationally, which is how the law of attraction works.
So I've done past lessons talking about the law of attraction, but now we're going to talk about how to actually use that in your life. And one of the things that comes down to immediately, and I want to start off before we go any further, is to tell you this. If you want to attract quote unquote, the life you want, if you want to manifest the life you want, or if you just want to create the life that you truly want, the first thing that you need to start doing is to stop focusing on what you don't want. So I'm going to take a, take a pause and I'm going to ask you a question before you go any further. When you were, if you were to take yourself out of your own head and look at everything that you think throughout the course of a day, between your 60 to 80,000 thoughts that you have every single day, which is about average for a human, are you focusing and thinking more about what you want or are you focusing about more of what you don't want, what you fear, what you're worried about? Because what you focus on, you will get more of. And uh, the reason why I'm doing this episode is because my girlfriend, Lauren, and I, we were driving about three nights ago. We were driving back from dinner and we were just talking about life and about how I feel like basically all of my dreams have come true. Like I don't really have a whole lot of goals because I'm like, damn, I kind of checked them all off the list, which is awesome. But I feel like I am the creator of my reality. Like I feel like I created this life. Now, obviously I had people that helped me. I had mentors along the way. No man is an island. But I feel like I created this as if I was a painter that walked up to a blank canvas and just wrote down exactly what I want. And I drew out this perfect life and I created it. And one joke that my mom and I have had for a really long time, since I got started getting into personal development about 15 years ago, since I got into the law of attraction and trying to manifest things, is that I tell my mom, and I've told her, because she's always like, how do you always, she's like, you always get what you want. And I'm like, most of the time I do get what I want. And the reason why, and here's a secret, this is what I told my girlfriend the other day, is the opposite of what I want. So first off, actually, before I say that, I know exactly what I want. I'm very clear on exactly what I want. I'm very clear on the the life I've wanted to create, the lifestyle I've wanted to create, the traveling that I've wanted to do, the money that I want to make, the person that I want to attract into my life, the people that I want to be surrounded by. I'm very, very clear on all of those. The reason why I happen to get those things in my life is because the opposite of what I want doesn't even exist in my reality. In my head, I never go to fear that I won't get what I want, worry that something could come up in the way, worry about other people's opinions. The opposite of what I want doesn't even exist in my reality. So why do I get the life that I, why do I have the life that I've created? Is because nothing else exists in my reality. I'm walking up to a blank canvas and I'm painting whatever the I want to create right? So when you think about your life, are you thinking of your life the exact same way? Or are you thinking about the things that you don't want? Are you focusing on worry and fear and sadness and all of the negative emotions, right? So I can give you many examples in my life. First off, since I'm already talking about my girlfriend, my girlfriend didn't want to date me when she first met me. She didn't want a boyfriend at all. She just got out of a relationship a couple months before. And I was like, hey, that's great and all, but I think I'm pretty good. I think you're pretty good. I think we'd be a good match. And eventually she was like, oh, I do like this guy, right? So she was like, yeah, she tells the story all the time. I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't in the mood. I didn't want to date people. I was just kind of having a great time by myself. But I was like, I really like this girl. I'm really attracted to her. I think that we fit really well. And now we've been together for years. And you know, because I just feel like that's what I wanted. And in turn, she was like, oh, I'm starting to see who this guy truly is, right? So the first thing I can think of is is with Lauren. When I was younger, way before that, I used to sell knives. I worked for a company called Cutco and I was, I'd never been in sales before, but all I wanted to do is be the, the very best sales rep that I possibly could be. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to be number one in the office. There is no other option. I, I will not be anything other than that, right? And so I built up some confidence, I built some confidence and eventually became number one in the the office that I was in, in Tampa. Then I became a manager with the company. I was like, I will not lose to anybody else because I feel like I am the best that exists. I'm out there. And it was just this this inward belief. It's never a cockiness or anything like that. It's just this, this confidence, this inward belief that I know who I am. I know what I deserve and I know what I can do and my capabilities. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create it. So then I built my office, number one office, United States, right? 
then I left there because I was like, I feel like I've done everything that I can. And then I decided to, you know, go into the corporations that I went into. And I was the youngest sales rep in those companies, but still also became the number one sales rep in those companies. I decided to start a podcast, became, you know, the, the top motivational podcast in all of iTunes. We're going to do about 50 million downloads in the next year. And, uh, and then I decided to start a Facebook page and have my videos start to go viral. So I put time into figuring all of those things out. You know, we're about 1.5 billion views on Facebook. And I don't say these things to brag in any sort of way. I just say them because number one, I know what I want. Number two, the opposite of what I want, failure, doesn't exist in my mind. It doesn't exist in my reality. And if it doesn't exist in my reality and I am the creator of my reality, then there's absolutely no way that I will fail. So that's number two. And then number three, I just don't give up. I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't see anything as failure unless you give up. And so I just decide slow and steady wins the race. Life is a marathon. Business is a marathon. Everything's a marathon. I'm going to put every ounce of energy that I have into whatever this thing is that I want. And I'm not going to do anything else until I succeed at it. Right? So I don't say any of these things to brag. I just say it because this is my perspective, what the past 15 years have been for me and how I've created what I have. And it comes down to what I tend to focus on right? And I say this a lot to, I teach coaches how to impact the world and how to make money and how to grow their coaching businesses. And one thing that I always say to them is don't focus on this not working out. Like if you're trying to build this coaching business, not working out should not exist in your reality, right? Because if it does, and you're focusing on uh, what if this doesn't work out? What if I can't pay my bills? What if this person says no to me? What if one of my clients cancels? You're probably going to create that in your reality. But if you step up and you say, this will be the business that makes me the dreams, the dream life that I want, I'm going to impact the world. I'm going to do this and this and this, and that's the only other option that exists for them, then that's what they're going to create, right? So I want to pause and take a step back. And when you hear me talk about these things, the first thing I want to say is I haven't always been this confident in my capabilities. This is 15 years of working on myself and actually seeing how this works and understanding the law of attraction, understanding manifestation, understanding even if the law of attraction manifestation are not things that you focus on or they're not in reality, they sound too woo wooey for you. I think that I'm a creator and I'm creating my reality at every single moment with every single thought and with every single action. With that being said, when you listen to my story and you think back of your story, when you think about the things that you focus on, you think about the thoughts in your head, the 60 to 80,000 thoughts every single day, are they focusing on everything that you want or everything that you don't want? Think about that for a second. Are you concentrating on building the life that you want or are you concentrating on, I hope this doesn't, I hope I don't fail. I hope other people don't judge me. I hope this person doesn't cancel their order. I hope this works out for me, right? And so you have to have this internal confidence that will be built. It will, the more that you do it, and the more you, if you try this out and it works for you, you'll gain a little bit of confidence. You try it out and you get works for you. You gain a little bit more confidence and more and more and more. And over years, it just compiles into, I don't lose. And that's what you'll start to get to is just, you won't lose. Winners win. And when you step into becoming a winner and you have that winner's mentality, losing doesn't exist. It doesn't because you just won't give up, right? And so, like I told you, my mom says I get everything that I want. It always, it always, she always makes a joke on it. I just feel like I'm kind of dancing with the universe. Like I, I don't know the way the universe works and I don't think I ever will. I don't think I'm ever going to be that intelligent. God, the universe, whatever is out there. I just feel like we're kind of in a dance and we're, we're having a tango and I'm moving and it's moving and we're figuring it out together. And, and I don't even like to, you know, it's hard to, to use the right words because when I say the life that you want, I'm also taking a step back in my head because I don't even necessarily know if the word want is the best word because want is a word that comes from a place of lack, right? A place of, I don't have this thing. And in order to be a powerful creator, you have to create from a place of absolute certainty and pure fulfillment as to where you currently are. So when I want something, a lot of times I'm wanting something coming from a place of lack. 
I don't have this thing and this thing that I want will complete me in some sort of way, right? That's the reason why a lot of relationships don't work out is because people want to get into the relationship because they are their quote unquote better half or because they complete them. No, it's not, you know, this person completes me. It is that you are already a complete person. They are already a complete person. And the two of you together make a really freaking powerful couple right? It's not like I'm, I'm incomplete without this person. That person's incomplete without me. We're, we're, you know, two halves. No, it's like your whole, their whole, and you're creating something amazing. So I hesitate saying that this is a life that you want because I feel like it comes from a place of lack, but I, I'm really running out of words to use here. So we're just going to have to use those words, but you know, it's not even, the, it's not even that you want it. It's that you are absolutely certain that it will happen. You know, so how can you brainwash yourself in a sense to being like my future that I want is going to happen. And so when people usually hear about the law of attraction, they hear about manifestation, they think that they're supposed to go into some, you know, nirvana state and meditate and they're going to start floating and then that they're going to say oh money is freeing freely flowing into my life from all layers of the universe and the, the perfect lover that i've always wanted my entire life is going to be knocking at my door soon like all that stuff's beautiful if that's what you want to do but i just happen to be a very you know analytical logical person and i'm like you know what instead of actually sitting there and just meditating on the idea i'm going to fully embody the idea there's nothing wrong with the meditating on i promise you that i do meditate as well but it's like i'm with with every action that i take i am going to be the person that will create this life and i am going to create this reality from absolute certainty so i know that for some of you guys this probably is a big step because maybe you haven't gotten amazing results in everything that you've been wanting to do in your life and so to think okay i and if i look in my past i don't have a whole lot of examples of massive success from me right i've been there before i understand exactly what you're talking about if that's sitting in the back of your head but you have to be able to strip away the past and strip away the present and say hey none of those things actually matter at all for the future that I'm going to create. And so I've got to, in my head, start from a place of absolute certainty. What do I need to do to start from a place of absolute certainty? Well, I need to strip away the past, I need to strip away the present, I need to say the future is being written at any moment, every moment, everything that I do. I've got to, number one, be very clear on what it is that I want. You guys have heard it said in ancient texts, the Bible, all of them, they say, ask and it shall be given, right? Well, if you're going to ask for something, if you're going to focus on something, you better be very, very clear on exactly what it is that you want. So the first part of creating this absolute certainty is to number one, be very clear on what it is that you want, because when you're very, very clear on what it is that you want, it makes it easier to go and hit it. You've heard me say it before. If I were to take you and the number one archer in the entire world and have you two line up and shoot a bow and arrow at something, some target, they're going to beat you every single time. But if you blindfold them and spin them around so they don't know what direction they're facing, and then you are able to, you know, literally see the target and have nothing over your eyes, you have a better chance of hitting it, not because you're better, simply because you can see the target. So the more clear that you can be on what it is that you want to create in your life, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to create it, right? We are all conscious creators. We are creating at every moment of our lives the exact life that we want, right? You are creating it. If you focus on what you want, you will create more of those things that you want. You will notice the people, places, opportunities, things in front of you that will create that. If you're focusing on what you don't want, you will notice and create the people, places, opportunities, and things that will create the reality of what it is that you don't want right? You've heard me talk about this before. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system that is basically the brain's filtering system. At any moment in time, your brain could, if it would probably explode, if it were to be able to take all this in, take in about 2 trillion bits of information, but it only takes in 200 bits of information per second. So your reticular activating system is the filtering system. And so if you're going into your day and you know what it is that you want, but you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Then your reality is going to show you all of the places that you are not good enough. Why? Simply because your reticular activating system, the filtering system is going to find all of the places that you're not good enough. Your brain is basically like cosmic Google. Whatever you ask of it, it will find the answer to. 
You ever have any friends that have terrible relationship problems and they're like, why do I always find the guys that cheat? Right? If you ask yourself that question, your brain's going to go, it's going to pull up all of the answers as to why you only find the guys that cheat. But if someone were to ask that different question, say, why do I deserve to have somebody who's loyal? Your brain's going to pull up all the answers. Which one are you focusing on? On all of the people who are the cheaters and why you find them? Or on why you deserve to have someone that's loyal? Right? If you focus on what you don't want, you will get what you don't want because your reticular activating system is focused on those things. If you focus on what you do want, you will get more of what you do want. So if you know exactly what it is that you want and you set your reticular activating system to go and get it, once again, the people, places, opportunities, things will pop up in your life and show you where you could possibly move forward in the direction that you're looking for. So you have to be very clear of what you're looking for. A, a perfect example of this is I went um, a few years ago, my friend, it was his birthday and we went on these really fast go-karts. They went like 50 miles an hour. And the guy who owned this track here in Austin is an ex F1 driver. He used to actually drive an F1. Super funny, nice French guy making jokes the whole time as he's explaining everything to us. And then he got really serious at one moment. And he said, listen to me, looks everybody straight in the eye. He says, if there is a crash, which there will be, and my friends are kind of crazy. So there were a lot of them. He said, do not look at the crash because you will hit them. You've got to look at where you want to go. And I was like, that makes so much sense. That's exactly how life is. Because if you look at the crash, what you don't want, you will hit the car in front of you. You ever see a car on the side of the road on the interstate and they're not moving, but somehow some cars just end up hitting them, even though they're not moving because the person was looking at it. So what are you looking at? Are you looking at where you want to go? Or are you looking at the crash and where you don't want to go? If you've ever been, you know, if you've ever, anybody who listens, rides a motorcycle, knows someone who does, they say, look through the turn, right? So don't look at where you are when you're in a turn on a motorcycle. You're looking at where you want to go because your body, your brain will position you to get to that spot. So you don't look at where you don't want to go. You only look at where it is that you're trying to go. The same way with your go-karts, same way with your motorcycles is exactly how it works in life. You look and you focus on only what it is that you want to go and you don't have any other example that pops into your head. If you're a salesperson out there, the thing that I teach my, the, the, the coaches that I teach, you know, a lot of people and salespeople say this is, oh, I, I hope this person doesn't say no to me versus I'm going to have this, this, this person's going to buy for me. So instead of thinking I'm going, this person's going to buy for me, people think, I hope this person doesn't say no. And if you go into it with the energy of, I hope this person doesn't say no, what do you think they're more likely to do? To say no, right? Everything in life is energy. But if you go into it, if I, if I just think about the energetic state of my body of this person's going to buy in what type of state that would put my body in and how that would change my physiology, how that would change my voice to, I hope this person doesn't say no, right? Like there's a different energetic state that both of them put me into. This person's definitely going to buy and I'm going to change their life. Or I hope this person doesn't say no in how that energy is going to translate to the other person. They're probably going to say no, right? You ever, you ever walked into a room and started talking to someone and immediately you got, mm, yeah, this doesn't feel right. It was bad feelings. We've all been there before, right? And then something happens down the road that shows you, oh yeah, my original feeling about that person, I was right. You ever also had feelings though? You meet somebody and immediately you're like, I feel like I've known this person forever. And you become great friends. It's the energy. Think about how the thoughts of what I just said change the energy of how you go in to what is it you do. It changes the emotion into it. Emotion is energy in motion. E motion, energy in motion. So if I think thoughts, it's going to change my energy and the way that I feel. It's going to change the way that I act, which is going to change my results in my physical world because everything is energy. And you can sense when energy is on, you can sense when energy is off. But the key to it is you have to think about the thoughts that are going through your head at any moment in time, every moment in time. Are the thoughts that are going through my head getting me closer to or further from my goals? Am I focusing on what I want or what I don't want? And you have to literally analyze every single thought that you have. And it'll take some time. It'll take time to get used to. I've been doing this now for 15, 16 years now. 
but I have so much proof of how my thoughts change my energy, change my actions, change my reality. And so it, what it takes is, is ultimate self, self-awareness. You've got to think about every single thought that's coming through. You've got to think about every energetic state that you get into. You've got to think about every action that you have. And it takes time. It takes a lot of mental energy when you first get into this. But then what happens is you start to change your thoughts. You change your thoughts. You change your thoughts. And now instead of being habitualized to think negative thoughts and to think about what you don't want, you start being habitualized to think positive thoughts and what is it you do want. Because at any moment in time, every single thought that you have is creating your reality. But you've got to think about this. Are the thoughts that you are having creating the reality that you want? If you change your thoughts, you change your reality, you change your future. Make sure that you know what it is that you want and then make sure that every thought that you have lines up with that future that you want. And that will then manifest the future in the life that you want. Today, we're going to be talking about the incredible future that you want that seems, and I get it, sometimes when you think about the life that you could have, the life that's in your dreams, the the cars, the houses, the love, the spouse, the family, the traveling, the private jet, whatever it is that you want, you think, oh my gosh, it would be so nice to have this thing. But what we tend to do is by having that feeling of it would be nice, what we're actually doing is we're actually pushing that thing away from us energetically because the the would be nice feeling actually makes it feel like, ah, never going to happen. Can you relate to that? Where you have the feeling of, man, I would love to have that house on the water. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But $3 million, I don't know if I could ever afford $3 million, right? And what you're doing is you're actually pushing yourself further away from the life that you want, from everything that you want because of the feeling of, mm, I just don't know if it's possible. So today we're going to talk about is how to normalize the feeling of the success that you want. And when I mean, when I talk about normalizing, I'm talking about normalizing energetically inside of your body, how it feels to think about those things, how it feels to think about owning those things, and how it feels to think about you being the person that could attract all of that success, all of that happiness, all of that love, all of that life that you truly want. Because the house, the car, the family, the love, the travel, all of those things, the easiest way to get those, and this is gonna be kind of a, a, a mind mess up for most of you guys, the easiest way to get all of the stuff that you want in the future is to have them before you have them. And you're like, what the hell does that mean? To have them and to feel them energetically. And I understand for some of you guys that are analytical, you're like, this is, sounds like some woo-woo BS. Trust me on this. I, I get it. I've, I understand this. I'm extremely analytical, but also I can dip my toes into the woo-woo-y stuff that's out there as well. The easiest way to have the life that you want is to have it before you have it, right? So for those of you that are like, I don't get it, you're going to get it. Just follow along with me, okay? This is the reason why people who grow up rich, it's a lot easier for them to make money, right? Because energetically, it's just normal for them. And what I mean energetically, I'm talking about the feeling inside of your body. When I grew up and I used to look at people who had money, there was a part of me that was like, I don't know if I'll ever have it. I don't know if I'll ever get there, right? Can you relate? If you've, if you've grown up not having a whole lot of money, have you ever had the feeling of, I don't know if I can do it though, right? I've had those feelings and most people have those feelings as well. Those feelings inside of your body are what's holding you back from actually getting it, right? It's the reason why people who grow up with money end up usually making a lot of money. Not always, but usually it's just easier for them. It's not too hard. It's not as much to struggle. And the reason why is because it's not too far down the road for them. They're already in the road. They're already on the road. They already know exactly what it is that they need to do. It's simple. It's just normal. That's what I mean by normalizing. If they grew up in a mansion, well, then it's kind of just the standard to live in a mansion, isn't it? And so when they see other mansions, they're not like, oh my God, look at those mansions. They're amazing. It's just like, oh yeah, well, yeah, we have one as well. It's normal. It doesn't feel like it's too far away. But this is also the reason why it's so hard to break free from where you currently are is because where you are feels normal. And the no more normal that you feel, the more uncomfortable it can feel 
to look at those things that seem so far out of your grasp. They don't seem like th something that you could ever get, right? And so you have to normalize the feeling. And I'll teach you how to do that today. And I'll give you an example of, of a, a feeling that is normalized. Have you ever um, gone to a friend's house maybe? Maybe your friend has a house. You, you become friends with someone who happens to have a, a, an incredible house. And you walk up to their house and the first time you're in it, you're just blown away. It's beautiful. You love the pool. You love the house. You love the decorating. You love the view. You love everything about it. And the first time you're there, you're almost like, holy crap, this is just so incredible. And then you go to their house again and again and again and again and again. And the more that you go to it, it's not like you aren't impressed by the house anymore, but it's just like, oh yeah, I'm just going over to Stacy's house. I'm just going over to John's house. I'm going over to Stacy and John's, right? And you're still like, wow, this house is beautiful, but it doesn't blow you away every single time. It blows you away the first time. And then what happens? It starts to become normal to go to Stacy and John's. That's really what it is, right? When I first moved into the house that I have now, I remember when I first walked in and I saw it, I was like, holy shit, I love this house. It's amazing. I've never lived in a house like this. I've never seen a house like this with this design. And I was just blown away by it. And then I realized about a month into being here, I was like, this just feels normal. And I was outside and I was, you know, the dogs were outside going to the bathroom. I looked back and I was like, I love this house, but it feels normal to be here now. Like it doesn't feel like, oh my God, it's amazing. It was just like, well, it, you know, it's the house I live in, which is awesome right? I love it, but it feels normal. It's a good thing. Normalizing the feeling. So I remember when I was a kid, I was lucky enough where even though I didn't grow up with a lot of money, I was lucky enough, in my opinion, to have an aunt and uncle who my uncle made great money. He had a business that was doing, you know, $20 million a year. And he had a nice house and a nice car. He lived in a gated community that was on the water on the, the, the beach in Florida, Siesta Key, Florida, which is a super nice beach. And, um, and it's the nicest community, the nicest gated community that's on Siesta Key Beach. And, you know, you would go into the gated community and he used to have a golf cart. And my cousin and I would drive the golf cart around. And I remember being a kid, consciously, 13, 14 years old, 15 years old, whatever it is that we were, you know, younger. So we were driving the golf cart and we would go and look at these houses. And I was like, these houses are amazing. These I'm going to, and I would tell myself all the time when I was a kid, I'm going to live in a house like this one day. I'm going to live in a house like this one day. I'm going to live in a house like this one day. And I would just drive around and I didn't realize that I had no idea what the hell I was doing. But what I was doing is I was starting to normalize the feeling of being around houses that were massive. And I was in houses that were on the beach with beautiful views and Ferraris and Lamborghinis outside. I was just, I was normalizing that feeling, right? So I was lucky enough to be around people like that. I was also lucky enough to see that my uncle is one of the kindest people I've ever met. And so sometimes it, when you're, when you don't grow up with money and you don't see a whole lot of money, you can see how sometimes people with money can be demonized in the media and people can talk trash about them. But I've said it many times in my podcast, some of the kindest, best people I've ever met in my entire life have boatloads of money. And they're kind and they're amazing and they're beautiful people. And that makes you realize, oh, they're not as bad as they tend to seem in the media sometimes, right? So I was lucky enough to be around people like that. And so I think that for me, the transition from not making much money to making a good amount of money was easier because I was around it and I was normalizing myself for years. Now, if you haven't been around somebody with money or any of that type of stuff, it doesn't mean that you can't normalize the feeling. I won't even lie to you. When I first moved to Austin, I used to, uh, there's, there's a couple areas in Austin that are gated and I just love driving around and looking at houses. And I love, I've always thought to myself, I want to normalize the feeling of being in houses like this and being in neighborhoods like this. And so what I would do is no joke. If I saw a neighborhood that I really liked, I would park across the street and just wait for someone to drive in. And I would just follow them in. Why? Because I want, I love to be able to dream. Right? I love to be able to think that this could be mine. Not because I just want to own more shit, but because I want to see what it would take from me to become the type of person to get something like that. Right? Think about that for a second. What would it take for me to be the person to be able to get that thing, that house or that, you know, car, you know, I was in a, a place the other day that I followed somebody in and they had a, a helicopter outside of their house. And I was like, that's pretty sick. I've never just seen someone's helicopter sitting outside. I thought it was amazing. So there's, there's examples of things like this. Uh, a good friend of mine tells this amazing story of how he, he normalized the house that he wanted. 
So he knew what part of town he wanted to live in. And this is in Austin and he lives out in the hills now. And uh, there was this big, beautiful house that was being built. And he was driving by it one day, this big, beautiful, modern house. And it wasn't finished. And you know, big houses take time to, to finish, right? They take years sometimes to finish. And he saw this big, beautiful house and he, he was like, I'm going to pull over and just see what the house looks like. And it was in the middle of construction. There was nobody there. It was like on the weekend or something like that or at night. And, um, and so literally he walked into the house and he's like, holy crap. Like I can see it's got a pool. I can see it starts to see the layout of the house. I can see the view of downtown Austin through the hills. And so what he did was every day, and this is important, every day he would literally leave work he has his own business, but he would leave work and he would tell himself, I'm driving home, I'm driving home, I'm driving home, I'm driving home. Every single day, he would drive to that house first and he would get out, park his car in the driveway. You know, he'd get done with work six, seven o'clock. So usually the guys aren't doing construction by that time. And he would literally walk into the house, walk into the front door and say, I'm walking into the front door of my house. He would walk in and he would literally start to go through the house and say, this is my bedroom. This is my, and you know, some of you guys are like, that's kind of creepy. The guy's walking through a house. that's not his. Nah, it can be creepy, whatever, but you know, no judgment. And then he would go to the view and he would, he would visualize himself sitting there and drinking his cup of coffee every single morning. I'm going to drink my coffee, this view, drink this coffee, this view. And he would normalize it day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. And it became normal. The feeling of the house went from holy crap, this view, holy crap, this house, holy crap, this layout to this is my house. I just haven't, paid, I just haven't paid for it yet. Right. I'd recommend you don't do this at anybody who actually lives in a house. This would only be for construction, right? Don't go to someone's house and be like, this is my house when you knock on their door. But you know, go, you can go to the house and you went to the house and Eventually the house is finished and the people who actually paid for the house moved into the house. And then one day it went on the market and he went in to go see how much it was. And it was over a million dollars for the house. And uh, he went in to see if he could afford it. And the bank said he couldn't afford the loan, but he said, this is my house. This is my house. This is my house. And over the next 30 days, he was able to build his business to a such a significant number. He went back into, because you know this is before Austin's market was just insane like it is now. He went back into the, the loan officer and asked them, show them what his business was doing. It was able to make it work. He bought that house four years after normalized the feeling of that being his house. You could tell me that's a coincidence if you want to, but there's also something behind the scenes that I think is working, right? Whether it's the universe or God, or whether it's just the normalizing of the feeling, or maybe it is coincidence. He was able to normalize the feeling of that being his house, that being the house that he was going to. Now, what does he do? He walks into his house. He parks inside of his driveway. He sleeps in the room he told himself he would sleep in. He has coffee every single morning with the view that he told himself he was gonna have coffee with the view in. Why? Because he freaking created his reality, right? So you gotta think to yourself, which reality am I creating? What feelings am I normalizing? Am I normalizing the feelings of being broke because I'm hanging out with broke people all of the time, right? And they're talking about how, you know, the, it's the government's fault. It's the president's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's the, the local authorities' fault. So whatever it is that's going on around them. And they're like, they're blaming, they're taking all of the blame and externally putting on someone else. Or you hang out with people who make, you know, making a decent amount of money normal to you to feel that way. Right? What car do you want? Why don't you go test drive it? Guess how much it costs to test drive a car? Nothing. So if you have a car and it's on the background of your computer, like when I was younger, I used to have cars in the background of my computer, the background of my phone, all of that stuff. I want to see it. I wanted to normalize it. Why don't you, instead of having it be on a computer, which seems out of reach because you can't physically touch that car through your computer, why don't you go to the Audi dealership or whatever it is and test drive that car? Even if you can't afford it right now, and as you're driving the car, say, this is my car. I'm driving my car. I'm driving my car. I'm driving my car. I'm driving my car. And then go a month later and do it again. And then go a month later and do it again. And just keep test driving the cars and go to different places and start to normalize the feeling. If you have a, you know, a Toyota right now, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're looking and you're like, I want an Audi. Well, then as you're actually going to the Audi dealership, say, I'm going to pick up my car. I'm going to pick up my car. I'm going to pick up my car. And then you test drive it. And when you get back into your Toyota, you're going to go, damn, I am grateful that I do have this car that can drive me around, but that Audi was amazing. 
it's going to give you internal drive to work harder towards that thing that you saw, towards that thing that you want. It's going to normalize the feelings inside of you of actually having that. What if you want a great relationship? Are there people around you that have incredible relationships? It's, you know, maybe you grew up in a house that didn't, your parents didn't have a great relationship. Maybe they fought a lot. Maybe they got divorced and all you've ever seen was turmoil in a relationship. Is there someone that you know or people that you can get around that have an incredible relationship so that you can denormalize the feeling of turmoil in a relationship and normalize the feeling of what an abundant, beautiful, loving relationship looks like? If you want to be a great parent, maybe you have your first kid on the way. Do you know anybody that's an incredible parent that you can normalize the feelings of being an incredible parent? Anything that you want in this world is within reach. But if you look at something and you think to yourself, mm, I don't know, like energetically, it feels too much. To me, it feels like it's impossible. That is something that needs to be normalized because if you feel like it's impossible, it is 100% impossible. If it feels like it's out of reach, it is always going to be out of reach. The way to bring it into reach is to be able to start to, to, to live that life, to normalize the feeling of that house, to normalize the feeling of that car, to normalize the feeling of that relationship, to normalize the feeling of being a great parent, to normalize whatever it is that you want, because everything that you want is fully 100% within your reach. But if you think to yourself that it is out of reach, I promise you, you've already taken yourself out of the race before you've even stepped up to the line. The way to win in life is to figure out what it is that you want and to normalize those feelings because the life that you want is within reach. That 10 years from now, that perfect life, that beautiful family that travels all over the place and has the abundance of money to do whatever they want and to give it away and to give it to charity, all of that is within reach, but you have to normalize the feeling internally first before you actually get it externally. The question I have for you is, do you think that it's possible that you are being subconsciously programmed and you're completely unaware of it? Does that scare you? Would it make you pay more attention to your surroundings and every single thing that you did if you were subconsciously being programmed completely out of your awareness? Well, you just might be. And I'm going to give you a couple stories that make you realize how possible it is and how little people understand what's actually going on. So I'm going to give you a couple stories about it. One of them, there was a study that was done about something called unconscious priming. Unconscious priming, you can Google it, you can look it up if you like to, but Yale did a study to see if they could change the way that somebody feels about something simply by the temperature of the coffee that they're holding on to. And so what happened was they had these, these uh, students come in. They would come in and the researcher would meet them down on the bottom floor and they would say, hey, good to meet you, da 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 da. And then what they would do is they would say, they'd hop into an elevator and they had a lot of stuff in their hands. And they would notice, the researcher would notice that their shoe was untied. And what they would do is they would have, you know, they go, hey, can you hold my cup of coffee for me real quick? And so they would hand them the cup of coffee. They would put their stuff down, they would tie their shoe, they'd pick up their stuff, and then they'd get the cup of coffee back from them. And then, the person that was part of the research, but didn't know that they were part of the research at the time, that was part of the study that would go in and they would read a one page story. And it was just a, a typical story. And then they were given a quiz, real quick quiz at the end of it, where they were told to answer questions about the person. And, you know, so they would take one character from the story in the one page, and then they would answer questions about them. And, you know, all they would do is they would, you know, answer the questions, then they would go. And what they realized was this, was that even though they had just held a cup of coffee for about 15 seconds at most, it changed the way that they felt about the people that they were reading about about 15 minutes later. So here's what happened. The people that were given an iced cup of coffee, because there was iced cup of coffee that was handed to people, and then there was a hot cup of coffee that was handed to people. People that were given the iced coffee felt that the character that they had the questions about was much colder, less social, and more selfish. The people that were handed a hot cup of coffee for the researcher to be able to tie their shoe felt that the person was warmer, more social, and someone that they could trust. So let me pause right there. These people were given a cup of coffee one, of, one set of people were given a hot cup of coffee. One set of people were given a cold cup of coffee. And across the board, statistically, the people who were given the cold cup of coffee felt that the person was cold, less social, and more selfish. The people that were given the hot cup of coffee felt that the person was warm, more social, and somebody they could trust. So if they're given literally 
15 seconds of holding onto a cup of coffee and it changes their perception around the world around them and everything that they think about people, what is happening in your world that is changing your perception? Think about that for a second. How crazy is that, that just a simple temperature of something that somebody holds for 15 seconds can change the way they feel about people 15 minutes later? All right, I got some more stories. I'm not done. So there was also researchers that went in and they had uh, students come into a room and they had them answer questions, or, or actually come up and see how creative that they could be, right? And what they didn't realize was that some students went into this room and they were, they constantly, like three or four times, they saw the logo for IBM because IBM was just, you know, it's IBM is seen as a typical standard company, not very creative, but there was, you know, they, they said, okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put something up on the board and they'd turn the computer on. They'd see the IBM logo. It would be right there. And then they'd be, okay, this is what we're going to do. And what they had people do was figure out as many uses that they could use for a brick besides what a brick is normally used for besides like throwing through a window to break the window besides you know building a house any of that type of stuff what can you how can you be creative so they had people see the ibm logo three or four times before they were asked the question to write down what it was that they could come up with you know non-typical uses for a brick and then they had another set of people that instead of seeing the ibm logo they were they saw the apple logo and it wasn't like they're like hey this is an advertisement for apple it was just like they happened to see it it was either in the room somewhere or it just popped up as they went to go ask them the questions now if you look at the two companies between ibm and apple if you were to look at the two of them you say ibm is a pretty typical company not very creative not outside the box you don't really see a lot of advertisements for many of that type of stuff when you look at apple apple tends to be a very creative company people tend to think that they're a creative company they trust them a lot they have creative packaging they love a lot of you know there's people that are hardcore about apple i don't know too many people that are hardcore about ibm here's what's crazy exact same situation just different logos that they saw the people that saw the apple logo found three times more uses for a brick than the people that saw the IBM logo. Isn't that pretty crazy? Simply because people know that they're, when they deal with Apple, Apple is more creative. So when they saw the Apple logo, they became more creative in all of the uses that they could find. And the reason why it works like this is because your brain doesn't just have like one part of the brain that lights up. So the same place that the brain where Apple lies inside of your brain can connect other neurosynaptic connections in your brain for creativity. And it starts working together. The same way that when you hold on to a cup of coffee and you feel cold, it's, it lights up a certain part of your brain. And that certain part of your brain has other neurosynaptic connections around it. So when you see something, it doesn't just affect one part of your brain. It affects many parts of your brain. It's not just like one part of your brain turns on and the rest of it is off. And so it depends on what's actually lighting up inside of your brain. Another example of how this is used is grocery stores. Here's something that's really interesting, okay? One of the best that, I've, that I find as far as grocery stores that deal with people and uh, the way they, they skew and change your perception around everything is Whole Foods. Whole Foods is one of the first ones to do this. When you walk into a Whole Foods, what do you almost always have? I, I'm thinking of Whole Foods that I walk into that's right down the street. Flowers, right? Flowers and fresh produce. Why? Because they want you to feel that this is a, a, a fresh place to walk into because when you walk into a place that has flowers, you can smell the flowers, you can smell the fresh produce. It makes you feel as a human, like we are sensory organisms. We see a bunch of really bright, beautiful colors. We smell a bunch of beautiful scents. It actually turns on parts of your brain to go, oh yeah, this is great. I really like this. This is, I feel fresh in here. I've never walked into a grocery store and all of the dead animals and flesh was in the front. Why? Because that'd be a really weird place to put it. Where do they put the meat in every single grocery store? In the very back. Why don't they put the meat in the front? Because that's not how they want you to walk in. They want you to walk in seeing beautiful colors. They want you to walk in see, smelling beautiful scents. They don't want you to walk in and just see dead animal parts right there. And you know, I'm just telling you honestly how it is. And so what happens with the fresh flowers, with the fresh scents, everything, is it makes you a little bit more hungry and at the same time makes people feel better when they see beautiful colors and they smell beautiful scents. So. If this is what companies are doing and able to do with you at all points in time, do you think that in your life there might be unconscious priming that's happening around you that you're completely unaware of? Absolutely. 
100%. The best psychologists in the entire world work for advertising agencies, right? And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. And I'm just trying to make you aware of what's happening so that you can start to program yourself. And that's what we're going to do today. But advertising agencies know that at the core of every human fear, like fear that holds you back, at the core of every single one of them is the feeling of I'm not enough. And if I won't, if I'm not enough, then I won't be loved. And so advertisers know this and they exploit your psychological weaknesses. And what happens? They know the feeling of I'm not enough is what's usually at the core of most people's fears. And so what they do is they make advertisements to make you feel subconsciously like you're not enough until you buy our product. Simple. It makes sense. That's how they start to sell more. If you want to know more about this, there's a, uh, a, a beautiful documentary. It's like four hours long. It will blow your mind. Uh, that's called The Century of Self. I believe that's what it's called. A pretty, I'm like 99% sure that's what it's called. The Century of Self. And it goes through talking about how it used to be before like the 1940s. It used to be that people would, 1940s, 1950s, people would buy stuff based off of if they needed it. And then a lot of psychologists learned about psychology and human behavior. They came into advertising agencies and they started to actually use the advertising and the psychology in advertising to make people stop buying things that they need and make them buy things that they want. And so uh, the perfect example that they give inside of this, the century of self, is that there was i I'm gonna try to remember this because it was about two years ago that I watched this, is that a pre 1950s, cigarettes were seen as something that only men smoked. So women weren't really ones who smoked this. And so, uh, so there was a guy that came in and the guy that came in was actually the, uh, the, um, Sigmund Freud's nephew, who Sigmund Freud's nephew. And he came in and he's like, I'm going to come in and help you with the psychology behind this, because if you're only selling to men, you're missing out on an entire 50% of the market that's out there. How can we change the perception and start selling cigarettes to women so that women can start, you know, start start consuming them and so what happened was they came up with this big campaign and they uh what they said is there's gonna they they had these women and inside of these women were there's this big massive like thanksgiving parade or something like that and so they had the women go and they were walking through and they they went to all of the news outlets and they said there's going to be a line of women who are going to be, uh, they, I think they called them suffragettes is what they called them. And they said, they're going to go and, um, and, and have, have freedom torches that they're going to show to take over their power, take their power back. So they're gonna have freedom torches. And what happened was they went to all the news groups. There's gonna be these women, they're gonna have freedom torches. So the news group's like, what the hell's gonna happen? We gotta see whenever this thing happens. So as soon as they're walking, there were these women that were in these, these dresses they had inside of their, uh, inside their, their dresses, they had cigarettes. And so all at once, when they got in front of all of the news and media outlets, they took out their cigarettes, they lit them in front of every, everybody. And that was the way that women, to, in this perception of, of what happened here, took back their power to be able to smoke cigarettes and say, it's not just gonna be men that are gonna smoke cigarettes, it's gonna be women as well. And that alone sparked women smoking cigarettes from the 50s on. And so they knew how this psychology worked. It's mind blowing when you start to see how psychologists are in advertising and actually hijack your system and exploit your psychological weaknesses. So once again, I'm not saying this to be doom and gloom. I'm saying this so that you can understand that your mind, if you're not very self-aware, is able to be hijacked very easily by people who understand how your mechanisms in your brain work better than you do, right? And so you've got to start thinking about these things. If an advertising agency can make you feel differently just by watching a 30 second ad to make you want to buy their product, if a grocery store can make you feel differently based off of the stuff that you see and the stuff that you smell, if a brick can you come up with three times more uh, uses for a brick simply by the logo that you see walking into a room? If you know a company, if, or if a, a school can make you feel differently about someone that you read in, on a piece of paper simply by the, the temperature of the coffee that you're holding onto, then there's millions of these things happening around the place and you've gotta be very aware of what's going on. This is one of the reasons why I tell people not to watch the news because the news is hijacking this system like crazy right now. It's also why I tell people not to watch stuff like reality TV, you know, people that are yelling at each other and terrible people and you know, the, the Kardashians and all the shows that are happening where people just, they don't seem to treat very people very well every time I've seen that. And also when there's like the, what, the housewives of whatever place they all are at now, 
the, what happens is when you're watching these things, it might be like, oh, this is just a mind, you know, I've, I was busy all day. I just want to watch something that's just entertaining. You've got to ask yourself, is this just entertaining or is this making me feel better about myself in the world around me or worse about myself in the world around me? You know, is the news keeping me informed or is it keeping me conformed? And then you also got to start thinking about the people that you surround yourself with. You've heard me say before, and you've heard everybody say before, you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. You know, if you hang out with five people that are extremely fit, you're go even if you're not in shape, you're going to get in shape simply because the same way that all these things get into your brain, all of the people around you are going to get into your brain in certain ways as well. Oh man, they're fit. I'm fit. Subconsciously, you're going to go, I should actually start working out more. They invite you to go work out. You start showing up because you want to feel better about yourself. You want to fit in with the people that you're around. You know, if you hang around five people that are completely out of shape, you're probably going to be the sixth. If you hang out around five millionaires, you're probably going to be the sixth. If you hang out around five alcoholics, you're probably going to be the sixth. You know, so you got to think the people that are around you, how are they programming you, right? The people that you follow on Instagram, is it pro programming you in some sort of way? I always tell people, go through your newsfeed, go through the people that you follow. Just now that you know that this is a thing and start removing people that you feel are not good for your own personal psychology. Now, the reason why this is important and this shouldn't be something that disempowers you, but something that empowers you is because when you realize that this is how the world works, this is how your brain works, you can take back your power and you can use it the way that you need to. So you can go, okay, beautiful. This is how it works. I understand that this is my, my system being hijacked. I understand that this is going to affect me this certain way. The music that I listen to, is it something that makes me feel better? Or is it something that makes me feel worse? Is this how I would talk to somebody in real life? Or is this just something that I say when I'm all alone and I, want, I don't want to say this when my mom's around, or I don't want to say this when my girlfriend's around, or I don't want to say this when people that I respect are around, right? You start thinking about every single thing that you do. You start thinking about the people you hang out with, the music that you listen to, the ads that you see, the, the, the news that you watch or don't watch, the food that you eat, the places that you shop, and you start to become very aware of, oh, that makes sense now. Oh, that makes sense now as well. And it's not doom and gloom. It's actually empowering because you go, you know what? I'm going to surround myself with all of the people, all of the stuff, all of the, the music, all of the, the podcasts, all of the YouTube videos, all of the books, all of the people that are going to get me to a better level of who I want to be. Because if anybody can hijack the system, why can't I hijack my own system? Since I'm in the system all day long, why can't I hijack my own system to create the life that I want, to become the person that I want to become? Because ultimately, every single thing that you do is unconsciously priming you. Everything that, every single thing that you're around is unconsciously priming you. So you've got to ask yourself, am I in control of my priming? Am I taking control of it? Or am I just leaving it up to chance? Because when you're very self-aware of this and you're very intentional with it, you realize that everything in your environment can either empower you or disempower you to create the life that you want to. So be very careful and motivate yourself, inspire yourself with every single piece of content, every single thing that comes into your brain, every single thing that you see, hear, interact with, all of that stuff. And eventually you're going to realize that you consciously primed yourself to become the person that you want. The other day, last week, I was in the paint store and I don't watch the news. I don't watch TV. I don't even have, you know, any TV stations that could come in. Got Netflix and YouTube. That's basically all I watch on my TV in my house. And I was inside of the paint store and I won't tell you what station it was on or any of this stuff, but what it was on was it was on a very popular talk show won't tell you which one it is. And it happened to be on a station that the talk show was talking about a lot of things that were very politicized. And um, every time it would go to the, the commercials, the commercials would have a news flash, like little break that would happen. And it was another thing that was going on, right? And what I became aware of in this moment, obviously I've known it, but to be able to actually see it, I was in there for about three to four minutes. And I was like, I wonder what they're actually gonna be talking about. And it was so blatantly obvious to me that this station was trying to push their propaganda to make you think and feel a certain way. Now, I'm not saying what station was, any of those things, but what I'll tell you is, no matter what side it is, whether it's the left or the right, whatever it is, they are trying to have a war for your mind by throwing out propaganda and things and making the world seem a lot worse than it actually is. Right. And within three to four minutes of being in there, I became very uncomfortable because I was like, I can literally feel how other people 
that don't know this is going on can think that the world is absolutely terrible right now, to think that the world is absolutely going to shit, to think that there's so much to be afraid of and I've got to pick a side of what side I'm on. You know, I've got to be on this side. And when I pick a side, this is important to know, when I pick a quote unquote side, that puts me on one side, which means that there is always an enemy, which is the other side, right? And it was so obvious that this one side was trying to push their agenda and push their agenda and push their agenda. And to somebody who is not aware of what is going on, they are going to be extremely easily influenced into number one, thinking the way this side thinks. Number two, seeing that there was a side that is against them that they need to be fearful of. And number three, think that this world is going to absolute crap. So there's a couple of things I want to pack out, you know, pull out of that and, and, and unpack. The first thing, why is the news so negative? And I, if I've done episodes on this before in the past. The news is so negative because as a human, our brains naturally go towards what is negative, aka what is wrong. Why is that important? Because 10, 20, 30, 100,000 years ago, when we focus on what was wrong, we were able to fix it, which then meant that we would stay alive. Because what was wrong 100,000 years ago could mean death if we don't fix it. So now, what happens is the news in this media, not even just the news now, it's also just the media, these stations, the, then they disguise them as talk shows, they disguise them as TV stations, they disguise them as all of these different shows that they put out there are out there putting fear and fear and fear and fear and fear into people. And the reason why is because when you're fearful, you're going to watch more because you want to find the solution to this problem. And the more that you watch these stations, the more money that they're gonna make off of ad revenue. If you watch them, you're going, they're going to get more ad revenue. The more millions of people that watch their shows, their TV stations, their news stations, their you know talk shows, all of those things, the more people that watch them, well, they're going to make more money. So that's the first thing. So you've got to be very clear as to what you're watching and to be very clear, is this something that is supporting me growing into the person that I want to be? Or is this something that's actually holding me back and keeping me in a fearful state? Just simple way to diagnose. Just ask yourself this question. What I'm feeling, what I'm watching right now, how does it make me feel? Right? If you're watching TV and the news happens to pop up and you say, how does this make me feel? And you're like, I feel really worried. I feel very fearful. And I don't feel very positive about the direction of the world. Turn it off, like get it off as soon as possible because that's not helping you create the life that you want. That's holding you back. That's keeping you paralyzed. That's immobilizing you versus mobilizing you towards what it is that you want to create, right? So the first thing to be very aware of is that they are putting fear into every person that's out there because it's an easy way to control. The second thing that you have to realize is this, and I'm once again, before I go any further, I'm not saying that the world doesn't have problems. The world definitely has problems and the world will always have some problems in some sort of way. There's 7.5 billion people on this planet. Are there a few bad apples out there? Are there are a few kooky people that are off the rails? Absolutely. There will never be nothing bad. I don't believe that will ever get to that point. What I'm saying is it is seems way worse than it actually is based off of number one, all of the cameras not now exist in the world because everybody's got a camera inside of their pocket. And number two, how it can be pushed over and over and over again through every platform, through the news, through social media, through everything that you could possibly see. So are, are, is the world perfect? No. Will it ever be? No. But it's nowhere near as bad as they make it seem, right? So that's the first thing to, to be very aware of. The second thing as to why would the media, I don't even just say the news anymore. Why would the media, the stuff you see on TV, talk shows, all of these things, why would they put so much negativity and so much fear-based stuff out there? Reason why is because the easiest way to control people is through fear, guilt, and shame. Let me say that again. The easiest way to control somebody is fear, guilt, and shame. Think about what's been going on the past year and how much fear, guilt, and shame has been put out into the media. It is crazy how much has been put out there, right? And I'm not talking about any side. I don't, I'm not part of any side, just so you guys know. I don't believe in any specific side. I don't think that there is a side to just go for. But when somebody picks a side, as I said earlier, once you pick a side, you now have a side that you're against. Right? If I'm rooting for one basketball team, if I'm watching a game and the Miami Heat are playing and I'm a Heat fan, they're playing another team. That other team I want to lose. 
So if I'm on one side, whether that's the left or the right or whatever it is that people believe in at this point, I want the other side to lose. And when I want the other side to lose, I'm losing. And the reason why is because when you can, when, when we're, we're split up and divided, it's the, the phrase that we've all heard, united we stand, divided we fall. If we divide as humans, we are easy to control. We are easy. I don't have a side, right? I don't, I don't have a specific side that's that, that, that I believe in or that I think is right or wrong. I think that there's different sides of both of them, but there's another thing that also is very important as well that people don't take into account is that you're seeing the world through your lens of the world based off of everything that has happened to you in your past, right? You're seeing the world. You think the way that you think. You believe what you believe based off of the way that you were raised and circumstances that were presented to you in your life. Let me say that again. You think the way that you think and you believe what you believe based off of the way that you were raised and circumstances that life presented you with. So someone who doesn't believe the exact same thing that you believe and think the exact same way that you think is because of the way they were raised and the circumstances that life presented them with. So it's very important to realize who's to say that if instead of having your life, you had their life, that you wouldn't think exactly the same as them. So what I want you to realize is that we need to stop looking at other people and saying, that's the enemy. I'm different than them. This is my side. That's another side. The only thing that we should be doing at this point is focusing on how we can love the other people. Now, this is really interesting because I put up a video on Instagram talking about this the other day. And most people were in full agreement. Yes, we need to figure out a way to love more, to love more, to love more, because the opposite of love is fear. Think about how much, if I, if I don't like the other side, whatever that side is, it's coming from a place of fear, right? Love is the only thing that's going to get us through all of this, right? There is no other way. Battling and picking sides will not solve our problems. Look at our government. If you're in the United States, all they do is just bicker like a bunch of little children, right? Oh, there's this side, there's this side. They're just battling all they're doing. There's no love at all in all of that, right? Closing off will not solve our problems. There is no other side that you can be on. The only side that you can be on right now or ever is human. You are a human. No matter where you're from, no matter what you look like, no matter what you believe in, no matter any of those stuff, none of those things matter. What you are is you're a human. And everybody else that's on this planet, all 7.5 billion of them are human as well. When we are divided, we are easily conquered. If you look around and you don't see the things in this world that you currently, if there's certain aspects of this world that you don't like, I completely understand that. But fighting is not going to create something better. What's going to create something better? Figuring out a way to love more, right? To unite, not to divide. When people are united is when things happen. But when we say that's evil, this person's evil, that side's evil, what happens? We get divided. And when you divide, nothing's going to actually happen. Nothing good is going to ha actually happen. Look at, look, at, look at the past hundred years of how much division has happened in the past 100, 200 years, right? Does it look like it's going in the right direction? Well, probably not. If you watch the news, it looks like it's going in the wrong direction really fast, actually, right? But anything that you've tried to do in the past and, and put somebody into a box, and anything that's happened that's put somebody into a box of this is what you believe, this is what I believe, this is what they believe, divides people. And when you are divided, you are easily conquered. So what we need to do is figure out a way to love more. Let me give you an example of what I mean. As I said a few minutes ago, people believe what they believe and they think what they think based off of what has happened to them in the past, what life has brought to them, and what they were taught, right? So I might look at somebody and say, you know what? I don't necessarily believe the exact same things that they believe. But does that mean I can't love them or find some sort of love for them? It might be hard sometimes, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. It means it's something that we got to work towards, right? So you look at, and you've heard the phrase, love your neighbor, right? Love your neighbor, love your neighbor. When we're divided, nothing's gonna happen that's gonna be, in, gonna be good. But when we unite and we can work through our problems, we can work through things that are going on, that's when things actually, that's when things actually start to change, right? So if I look at somebody and I say, okay, this person, I don't agree with much of what they said. 
Actually, I don't agree with most of what they say, but I didn't have their life. I didn't have them circ their circumstances. I didn't have any of the things that they had. So if I was in their exact same shoes and I went through the exact same life that they had, would I think the same as them? And there's a possibility that I would, which means that how can I say I'm better than them and that my opinion and my, my stance is better than them? I can look at them and I can say, you know what? I don't agree with them, not 100%. There's some things that we definitely on other sides, but I can love them either way. Why can I love them? Because number one, I'm an empathetic person. We all have empathy and we can always be empathetic towards other people and what they've been through in their lives, right? Number two, if I want things to actually change, I need to be able to look at someone who doesn't agree the same things as me and say, I can still love them through this. I can figure out a way to, to, for us to work together. That's the only way that this is going to work. And I could say, okay, if I go, come from a place of love, when I go and speak to this person, they're more receptive to listening to me and to listening to my side. If I go from a place of hate and a place of anger, they are way less likely to listen to me. And what are they going to do? They're going to build up their walls and they're going to push their side further. So if we really want to have an intelligent, intellectual, you know, adult conversation, maybe I should come from a place of love first and not a place from division and hatred towards them come from a place of love. And that would make them more receptive to actually listening to what it is that I have to say. Maybe that's a way that we can actually get them to change. Because if what they've been taught and what they, what life has presented them with, what if I come from a place of love and present them with a different option and present them with something different? Maybe then that would change them in some sort. Maybe it wouldn't. But in reality, I know that if we come from a place of love and everything that we do, life is going to be a lot better. And that's the thing that the world is missing. So what I want you to realize is that right now, there seems to be a war for your mind. You're in control of all of the things that you watch, all of the things that you listen to, all of the people that you hang out with, the music that you listen to, the media that you consume, whether that's visually, auditorily, the people that you hang out with, you know, you're in control of all of those things. And all of those things brainwash you in some sort of way. The question is, is it brainwashing you to become the person that you want to become? Or is it brainwashing you to hold you back and not get you to move forward, right? All I know is that when I walked into that paint store and I saw those three to four minutes, I was like, oh my God. I literally physically did not feel good in my body. And I was like, I got to get out of here as quick as possible. Because number one, I could see what it was doing to me. And number two, I could see what it's doing to other people who aren't necessarily paying attention and who don't have this knowledge as well. So just be, number one, come from a place of love. Be very loving in everything that you do. And number two, realize you're in control of the information that comes into your head. Be in control of it. Be very diligent about what you allow to come into your head. Number three, look at everyone else around you and realize that if I pick a side and if I become divisive, we're easily conquered. The only way that we're going to change this world into becoming the world that we want to be is we have to first become that change. If we want people to get along more than they're getting along now, we need to first be the people who start getting along with people. If we want people, people to be more loving, we need to first be the people that are more loving. Gandhi said it, still makes sense. Be the change you want to see in the world. What do you need to do and change within yourself to be the change that you want to see in the world. What change do you want to see in the world and how can you take that and put it inside of you? There's a war for your mind going on. Be in control of what's actually coming into your head. Be in control of every thought that you think, every action that you take, and come from a place of love in every single thing that you do. And I promise you, that'll be the first step towards a better world. I had put up yesterday a uh, Instagram and Facebook stories poll. And I put up a couple different things. And one of them said, do you think aliens exist? Yes or no. Uh, is money the root of all evil? Yes or no. And then one of them said, do you think the world is getting better or worse? And I was super surprised to find that 78% of the people who follow me think that the world is getting worse. Yeah, I was super surprised by that. And the reason why is because I think that the, typically the people who follow me tend to be more optimistic versus pessimistic. And so I wanted to dive into the issue to talk about my viewpoints of if I think the world is getting better or worse, because I was super surprised. And what I think is I think the world is getting better, but I think the world is going through an awakening. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Let's say that somebody is 50 years old, right? And they don't take care of their body. They eat whatever it is they want to eat. They eat greasy food. They eat really sugary food, lots of caffeine, just 
bunch of crap into their body. They don't care about anything. They, you know, they just literally eat whatever it is that they want to eat. Nothing healthy. Okay, let's also say that they don't ever work out. Never. They haven't worked out in years and years and years. And let's say they're overweight. 30, 40, 50, 70, 100 pounds of weight. I don't know what it is. But let's say they're overweight because of the fact they haven't been taking care of themselves. And they also don't get much sleep. They don't get good sleep. And then one day, that person has a heart attack. And the heart attack luckily doesn't kill them. But it does give them a heart attack. They do have a heart attack. Heart attack isn't fun, I'm sure. Never had one before, but I'm sure it probably isn't the most fun thing in the world. So you look at this and you say, after years and years and years of abuse and neglect and not treating their body right, their body has a heart attack. And because of that heart attack, the person wakes up and they go, oh my God, like I almost just died. I'm now becoming aware of how I haven't been taking care of my body. I haven't been treating it right. I haven't been giving it the right fuel. I have been just eating stuff for taste and not for actual health reasons. I haven't worked out in God knows long how it's been since I've worked out. I don't get any sleep. I don't get good sleep. I drink a lot of alcohol. And all of that over years and years and years and years has accumulated to this one moment of me having a heart attack. Now, I have a choice. Either I can go back to life as it was, or I can make some different choices based on my heart attack. And let's say that person decides, you know what? I want to live long enough to see my daughter walk down the aisle. I want to live long enough to be able to be a grandfather that ends up being able to play with his, his grandkids and go to their sports games and be able to continue to travel. And I want to live longer than just past the age of 60 years old. I want to live to 85, 90. What would it look like for me to live to 90 and see my grandkids get married as well? And they start to take care of themselves. They start eating healthy. Maybe they hire a nutritionist. They hire the nutritionist and take care of their body. They hire someone that, that teaches them how to work out and the right ways to move. They start figuring out ways to improve their sleep and they read books around improving their sleep. And because of this, this heart attack, their entire life shifts because they now woke up to how they have been treating their body. Why do I bring this up? Well, why don't you just think about what we've been going through? And actually, before we, we dive into what we've been going through, if somebody were to have a heart attack and then switch their entire lives around and change for the better and lived longer and was able to see their, their daughter walk down the aisle and to be able to hang out with their grandkids and have a better life and be healthier and happier and better sleep and all of that stuff, is the heart attack still bad? Or was the heart attack the thing, the good thing that came in to awaken this person from the sleep that they were in and the, the neglect that they were giving their body? And now, ah, that's amazing because you know what? Now I can treat my body the right way. And that heart attack woke them up, is what you can say. It is their awakening from everything that they were going through. Now, is a heart attack bad? Or was maybe the heart attack a blessing? Was the heart attack something that actually ended up being good? Because in the long term, it changed them. And I think basically what we're in right now is the middle of a heart attack, right? I'm assuming that when you go through a heart attack, it's not very fun. No one's like, holy shit, this is great. I'm having a heart attack. It's usually people are probably freaking out. It probably hurts a lot. It's probably something that you don't want to go through. But... If you think about what we're going through and the heart attack that we're going through, the amazing thing about it is that we're now starting to wake up to everything that is wrong in the world that we need to fix. And this isn't me saying this, I take this side of this. I don't take any side in politics or any of that stuff. In my opinion, it doesn't matter because everyone has an opinion. So it's just me talking from just a, this is the way that I view the world. We're now waking up to old oppressive and evil systems that are being brought to the surface. And a lot of people who were not aware of them are now aware that there's a lot of things happening that maybe they weren't aware of. Maybe different racial things, maybe different gender things. It's becoming apparent that some people have been held down by society. It's been apparent that maybe some people don't get 100% equal opportunities, like group A might not get the same opportunity as group B based off of where they lived or where they grew up in the, the, the school that they were able to go to in the education system that they had. It's becoming aware how our government is not set up for the people's best interest, but maybe their own. 
And people are starting to become very aware of these things, like a heart attack that wakes you up and goes, holy shit, something's not right. But in turn, now we're in the middle of a time where things can start to shift, things can start to change. So is having a heart attack fun? Probably not. I don't think anybody's ever, I've never heard of somebody using the, the adjective as fun for a heart attack. But does it seem like sometimes if you're in the middle of a heart attack, it's hitting the fan? Probably. But if you live through the heart attack, you make changes, you change your life, you change your lifestyle, did it turn out to be a good thing? My rebuttal would be yes. I do think, I, my argument would be yes. I think that it is something that helped. A heart attack is an awakening for bad health in most cases. Obviously there's circumstances outside that where someone just has heart problems, but in most cases, a heart attack is an awakening to bad health, right? Civil unrest is an awakening to how we should look at the systems that we have and see if we can make them better for all people. So the same way that a heart attack wakes up somebody who hasn't been taking care of their health, civil unrest wakes up the public to how we should be treating people and start to change our systems and processes. Make sense? So another thing <clears throat> that we should consider when we're talking about the, uh, the, the, the way that the world looks really bad right now is that you have to realize we're seeing a lot more footage, a lot more videos, a lot more pictures than we ever have of things that are bad that are happening in the world. Are there things that are bad are happening in the world? Absolutely. Are there more than there ever have been? Absolutely not. And I'm going to share some statistics with you around that in just a little while to tell you that. But I think what you also have to realize is that if you were to rewind 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 99% of people did not have a phone or, I mean, actually not even take phone. They didn't even have a camera to take pictures. If you would have talked to somebody 20 years ago and be like, yeah, I take pictures with my phone. They'd be like, yeah, you're fucking crazy. Cause that would make no sense to somebody 20 years ago, right? A phone was made to make phone calls. But if you just think about that, now every single person has a camera in their pocket at all times. They can take pictures of anything. So things that were kind of under the surface and hidden a long time ago are now coming to the surface and they have to come to the surface just like a heart attack so that you can be able to work through them. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing that I want you to consider is that now there's a lot more cameras than there ever have been. So if you're seeing more things and thinking that the world is worse because of that, you just have to realize there's just a lot more cameras than there ever have been. And once again, I'm gonna go over the statistics in just a minute. I think they're gonna kind of surprise you. Another thing that, I, that has shifted a lot in the past 20, 30 years is that the news used to be something that you could trust. The news had no, the news had no hidden agenda. Now we all know that they have their own agendas that they want to push to you. And so they're pushing them. Another thing that you can actually start to think about is the rise of social media. In my opinion, social media is not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It is just a thing. And the human condition is now coming out through social media. But the interesting thing about social media is that social media makes it easier to share information faster and more widespread than any time in humankind. So if it was 30 years ago and you saw something with your own eyes that was bad that happened in front of you, the only people you could really tell is you could, I guess you could call the cops. You could tell your neighbors, you could tell your family. But right now, if something were to happen bad in front of your eyes and you were to videotape it and put it up on Facebook and put it up on Instagram, it could immediately go viral. Millions or hundreds of millions of people could see it. News groups could take, pick it up and then it would be all over the place. So it's not that things are getting worse. It's just that the darkness is coming to light because we are able to share this information quicker than ever before. And to dive into the statistics, which I want to share with you guys, it, it's super interesting, is this. So there's a, um, I did my own research on this, and there's also a Harvard psychologist. He's a, a cognitive psychologist named Steven Pinker. He's actually got a couple books about, and a TED talk about how the world is getting safer and it's better than it ever has been. It just seems like it's not based off of the fact that we have a lot of information that we can share, pictures, videos, immediately. If you go to the Department of Justice's website, on the Department of Justice's website, if you look at statistics, firearm homicides are down 39% from 1993. So if you look at it, you think, oh my gosh, there's so many more people dying from guns. There's actually 39% less people than there were in 1993 
you know, and it continues to go down year over year. I'm not here to argue firearms, so don't even think that that's what I'm trying to get across. I'm just trying to give you plain and simple statistics to show you that the world is actually getting better, right? To make you feel better about, ah, maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was. Maybe it is actually starting to get better. Uh, Non-fatal firearm accidents are down 69%. So non-fatal firearm accidents are down 69%. The numbers of people who are murdered on a yearly basis in the United States is down. And now you might say, okay, well, what about outside of the United States? I understand there's, there's places where things have gotten worse and they've gotten better and things have gotten worse and things have gotten better. But if you look at the world collectively as a whole, and I understand there's going to be some anomalies to this, everybody. But if you look at the world collectively as a whole, the number of people killed in war is one twelfth of what it was in the 1950s and the 1960s. So you literally have to look at that and go, wow, one twelfth of what it was before 60, 70 years ago. So now, right now, is the safest time to be alive as a human. Is it perfect? Hell no, absolutely not. But what I think we're going through is a little bit of a heart attack. We're starting to realize some of the ways that we weren't taking care of our quote unquote body, other people's bodies, our system, our, you know, the body that we are all a part of, the governments that we're a part of, the local areas we're a part of, the nations we're a part of, and the world that we're a part of, we're starting to become very aware of old, evil, oppressive systems, and they're very blatantly in front of us now, and we're now able to start to work through those things. So is it the most comfortable time to be alive? Absolutely not. Will it get better? Will there be something good that comes out of all of this? I tend to be an optimistic person, so I think yes, and I would like to argue that with anybody. I think that it is getting better. Statistically, it's showing it's getting better. There's books that are written on it getting better. Is everything perfect? Absolutely not. There is no way you will ever hear me say that everything is perfect. And I don't think humans are perfect, therefore I don't think everything ever will be perfect. But I tend to lean towards the side of everything is working for me, not against me. The world is working for me, not to me. And if that's the case, I also feel the world is working for you and not to you. It's never working against you. It's always working towards your side. So is it perfect? Absolutely not. But what I would recommend is this. If you're starting to feel the feelings of, of the world being heavy, of the news being heavy, of stuff that's happening in society being heavy, turn off the news. The news is not there to support you. It's not there to inform you. I promise you that. I've done episodes before about how the news is literally just there to make you not informed, but conformed. And they put out a bunch of negativity because your brain is addicted to negativity because that's how the human species survived. So turn off the news if you're starting to feel like the world is heavy. Turn off social media if you're starting to feel like things are heavy as well. Go out and experience the world. Walk outside, look at the sun, and you'll realize Man, things aren't as bad as they seem to be when you watch them on the news. On the, on the screens, everything seems to be collapsing. When you walk outside of your house, it tends to be a lot better. And I'm a very optimistic person, so I think we're going in the right direction. I think we have a lot of work to do. I think there's a lot of things that still need to work, be, be worked through. But you have to realize that everything that comes into your brain influences the way that you feel. Everything that you see, influences the way that you feel. Everything that you hear influences the way that you feel. Every person that you talk to influences the way that you feel. Everything that you read on social media or see on TV is going to influence the way that you feel. And in turn, that kind of brainwashes you to be a certain way. So if you're thinking of it this way, if, if every single thing that comes into our brain in a way brainwashes us to feel a certain way, why don't we take control of our, our, our own brainwashing? Why don't I go, you know what? I'm not going to look at the news today. I'm not going to turn on social media today. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to watch some YouTube videos from some motivational speakers or from some psychologist or neurologist or whatever it is you're trying to learn from and be in control of your own brainwashing. Because I promise you this, if you're not in control of it yourself, you're still being brainwashed. Is it the brainwashing that you want? I would prefer to wake up and say, I'm in control of my own brainwashing. I'm going to put on the music I like. I'm gonna to listen to podcasts I like. I'm gonna read the books that I like. I'm not gonna turn on the news. I'm not gonna turn on social media. And I'm gonna hang out with the people that I like. Because ultimately, that's the way that we get better. So is the world getting worse? I don't think that it is. I just think that we're in the middle of a heart attack. And I feel like on the other side of this heart attack, the world will be better. People are gonna work it out. 
We're going to figure it out. And the evil, old, and oppressive systems will be worked through and released. And we'll be on our way towards a better society and hopefully better human connection. We're going to be talking about something that I should have probably talked about quite a long time ago. But uh, I talked quite a bit about anxiety and all of those things in March and April and as things were going on. And then I had a conversation with a friend uh, about COVID, about all the things that are happening. And I'm not going to give you my world perspective because who needs to hear another opinion in this world? So I'm not going to give you any opinions on anything. But what I will tell you is how I know how to work through anxiety, how I've helped myself get through anxiety, how I've had my friends help get through anxiety, have had clients get through anxiety and stress and depression, all of those. And there's a lot of heavy that's happening in the world. We can admit it. And first off, we probably need to admit it. Like this has been, for most people, a heavy year. Uh, it has been a lot of unknown things that we did not see coming up that have come up, right? And you can feel really heavy if you're a, a person that's very kinesthetic. You can feel lost if you're a person that's very head and analytical type of person. You might just be ready for this to be over. I'm actually pretty sure that everybody who's listening to this is ready for this to be over. But at this point in time, it's not. It just isn't. And so what comes down to is us accepting that. And I'm here to tell you, everybody, it'll be all right. It will eventually work itself out. And the quicker that we just accept that it is the way that it is right now, and that it will eventually be all right, that I think the easier it'll make our lives until it gets to at least some feeling of normalcy. And I'm going to try to help you feel better. And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and we were talking about COVID. And the fact that she's going home to her parents uh, for Christmas and she has a lot of anxiety around possibly bringing COVID home to her parents for the holidays, which is the worst Christmas gift you could give your parents. But she's afraid of giving that to her parents uh, going home for the holidays. Completely understandable. It makes a whole lot of sense. And she was talking about that, but more than anything else, what she was really anxious about is the fact that COVID is still around. The fact that we're still dealing with this thing, what are we, nine months into it? And she was just talking about how she was anxious and stressed because of that. Then the conversation went a little bit further and she was talking about, you know, the other thing that scares me a lot as well is the economy. Like, I don't know what's going to happen with the economy, with all of the inflation that's going on, with, you know, about 20% of the world's money or the U.S.'s money was just printed this year, you know, and just what's going to happen with the economy. And then she went into rolling into how she's also having these anxious thoughts around getting these test results that she's waiting for her dog. And, you know, the dog, the, the, the issues that's happening with her dog and the fact that her dog might have cancer and she's just at this point in time it's a waiting game for all of them right she, so it's a waiting game for the test results for the dog it's a waiting game for uh seeing eventually if covid's ever going to pass or what's going to happen with our lives next and it's a waiting game to see what's going to happen with the economy and uh i let her go through and talk about it and talk about it and then what happened was i mentioned to her that the things that she's having all of this stress and anxiety around, she has absolutely no control over. And that's what's giving her stress and anxiety, right? So she has no control over what's going on in COVID. She has zero control over that. She also has zero control over the economy. And she also has zero control over test results from blood work that was done a few days ago for her dog. Zero control over all three of those things. Now, before I go any further, I want you to think about the things that are making you anxious and ask yourself this question. Do I have any control over those things? All of the things that are bringing you worry and fear and anxious thoughts, do you have any control over them? Or do you have those anxious thoughts and feelings around them simply because of the fact that you have no control over them and you want to have control, but you don't? So your anxious thoughts could be coming from the fact that you want to have control over something that you absolutely will never have control over and you haven't just fully accepted that lack of control. Because of those three, three things that I mentioned to you about my friend, none of them, literally none of them, she can control. She cannot do anything about those. And it's not that those things don't exist. They all exist. It's that she's fighting them in her mind and that is bringing in the anxiety. So what are you fighting? Are you fighting things? And the other thing that she's not doing is she's not accepting. She's not accepting that they exist. They are here. They are the way that they are. She's just not accepting them. She is resisting the way that the world currently is right now. Right? That's what, at its simplest form, she is resisting the way that the world currently is. She's resisting the COVID. She's resisting the economy. She's resisting the dog's test results. She's just resisting. And this is not uncommon. Uh, 
the, I was reading an article the other day. It says depression has gone up four times, 400% from the exact same time last year. And I think a lot of the reason why is because people are feeling all of these anxious thoughts. And at the same time, they're, they're not accepting the way that the world is and they're, they're not allowing themselves to learn and grow and get better in these times and be able to work through it because they just so badly want the go, world to go back to quote unquote normal, whatever bit of normalcy that they can have again. And if you've listened to my podcast before, you've heard me say this, your level of stress, anxiety, worry, and fear and depression Unless you're clinically depressed, there's a completely different, that's a whole other episode that we could do. But your level of worry, anxiety, sadness, fear, all of those things, anxiety, all of that, your level of it will be in direct proportion to how much you're resisting the way that the world is. So if you're extremely anxious right now, I guarantee you are extremely resisting the way that the world is. You're extremely resisting something that is out there in the world, right? If you're having low levels of anxiety, and just a little bit, maybe it's just bubbling under the surface, which I feel is for most people how it usually works. It's not that it's full blown anxiety attacks. It's just, it's just a little bit of anxiety that's bubbling under the surface all day, every day. And the reason why is probably because you have a low level of resisting the way that the world is. You're wishing, all right, well, yeah, you know, it is this way, but I just wish it would go back to normal. I'm just so, I just want to go back to work. I want to see my friends again. I want to be able to hug my mom. And it's not that it's a full-blown panic attack for you. It might just be that you're just resisting versus full acceptance. You know, there's a shaman that I've worked with in the past and done psychedelics with, and he says, just surrender harder, <laughs> right? Just surrender harder. That's what we all kind of need to do right now. And actually what we need to do probably for the rest of our lives is just surrender harder. I'm not saying surrender to the powers to be. If you think that the, you know, the economy and the COVID and all of that stuff is being put on by some masterminds behind the scenes. I'm not saying surrender those. I'm saying surrender the fact that it is the way that the world is right now. And at this moment, there's nothing that I know of that we can do about it. So do I want COVID to exist anymore? No, hell no, of course I don't. But what can I do about it? What can I personally do about COVID, right? I'm just a college dropout. I don't know about COVID. I don't know anything about all that science and stuff. I can barely formulate words sometimes. How am I going to save the world from COVID? I'm not. So do I want it to be here? No, but it is here. And I've got to figure out a way just to accept that. And uh, you can either resist or you can accept. And those are the two things that you can really do. Yeah, it is the way that it is. It's not what I would have chosen, but it is the way that it is. And what you have to realize is that's completely my decision. And you can resist or you can accept. And that is completely your decision as well. It's fully 100% up to you. And what you have to realize is that the more that you're resisting, the more that you're stealing away your joy in the present moment. Your joy is being stolen from you in this present moment because of your resistance. Your joy, your happiness, your peace in this moment is being stolen from you because you won't just fully accept that, hey, the world is the way that it is right? If somebody breaks up with you, your joy is stolen from you. If you're resisting and going, God, I just wish that we would be back together again. And you're thinking about how the past used to be. And you're thinking about your love and all of the times that you hung out and watched Netflix and chilled and had all of those great moments. You're like, God, I just want it to be that way again, but it's not. And guess what? The more that you're resisting the fact that it isn't the way that you want it to be, obviously the more that it's going to be holding you back the more anxiety and stress and worry and fear you're going to be having around that thing. And you have to realize if your joy is being stolen from you in the present moment, your life is just a collection of present moments. That's all that it is. There is no past and there is no future. Everything that has happened to you and will ever happen to you in your entire life is in the present moment. Nothing has happened to you in the past. The past is just a present moment that has passed right? Nothing has happened to you in the future yet, but when that future thing does happen, that will be a present moment. And so if we're really serious about this and trying to make ourselves feel better, we need to be very aware that our entire life is just the present moment. The only thing that, ha that does exist and will ever exist for us is the present moment. And if we're resisting COVID, if we're resisting the economy, if we're resisting a breakup, if we're resisting test results, all of those things, we're resisting it and having our joy stolen from us in this moment when we fully can experience the love and the joy and the happiness and the peace that we truly want to, if we were to just step into it and accept, stop resisting and go, what is great about this moment right now? And just allowing ourselves to sink into the present moment more than anything else. 
And the perfect question to ask yourself, and this is what I asked my friend, I said, okay, now that we've gone through all these things, I got a question for you. The question is, are you okay right now? She's like, what do you mean? I was like, in this moment, in this very second, are you okay? And she's like, well, yeah, I mean, I'm good. You know, I've got this coming up and this. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't care about bills. I don't care about anything that's happening in the future. I don't care about any of that. Shit. In this very second, are you safe? And are you okay? She's like, yes. And I was like, now just think about that thought. Just, just marinate on that thought. How does it make you feel? And she's like, it makes me feel a lot better. And the reason why is because all of the stress and anxiety that we have is all for things that could possibly be happening in the future. And we make up all of these ghosts and demons into the future that could possibly exist. But in reality, it's never about those things. It's always about this present moment right now. So if you feel anxious thoughts, if you feel like there's something wrong, I want you to ask yourself in this moment right now, am I okay? Not, oh my God, I have pills I have to pay tomorrow or later on at five o'clock, I have to make sure I'm at this appointment. No, right now in this moment, this very second, are you okay? And if the answer is yes, can you sink into that feeling of being okay? Don't sink into the feeling of the anxiety of the possible things that could happen in your future. Can you sink into the feeling of being just fine right now in this present moment? Feel the feelings of what it feels like to be fine in this moment. Are you okay? You are. <sighs> okay, I feel better. I feel at least a little bit better. And if I can continue to notice when I feel anxious thoughts, and start to repattern myself to go, am I okay right now in this moment? Yes, I am. Okay. Am I okay? Right? 99.999% of the time, you're okay right now in this present moment. And there's nothing to be worrying about or anxiety that you should have, but you're bringing it up and forcing it onto yourself. Right? So if you have anxieties of anxiety or stress or fear or worry that you've been feeling, my question to you is this, what are you resisting? If you're anxious, if you're worrying, if you're fearful, if you're feeling those negative emotions come up, what are you resisting? Think about that for a second. What is it? What is it that you're resisting? Is it a breakup? Are you not accepting the breakup? Wanting it the way the world to go back to the way that it used to be? The fact that you're not, person's not in love with you anymore? What is it that you're resisting? And the question is, are you okay right now? Are you okay? And the other thing we have to do is we have to accept and that we can control almost nothing. Like we literally can almost control nothing. Like literally you can barely control your own bowels after Taco Tuesday. Like you can literally control almost nothing. You can't control other people. You can't control your children very well. You can't control the weather. We can barely control our own thoughts. Most of the time we can't. We can control almost nothing. And this is me telling you this as a recovering controlaholic where I realized on one of my, on my very first psychedelic journey that I did, that I was a control freak. I had control issues and that was causing all of my stress and my worry and my anxiety in my life. And so the past three years, three and a half years since I've done it have been a complete unraveling of just letting go of all the control and noticing it when it comes up and realizing that the more that I let go of control and the more, the less I try to control everything, the more amazing my life becomes. And so we can't control our first thought, but you can always control your second thought. And so even if the first thought comes up as an anxious thought, well then notice it, identify it, and then go, is that the thought that I want? No, it's not. Okay, what is a better thought that I want to replace it with? And replace that thought with a new thought. You can't control your th second, or you can't control your first thought, but you can always control your second thought. And if you change your first thought enough to whatever this second thought is, enough over and over and over and over and over again, you eventually repattern your brain and your thoughts and your second thought will eventually start to become your first thought. If you're naturally a negative person, identify that negativity and replace it with positivity. And if you do this over and over and over and over and over again, all day, every day, hundreds of times every day, depending on how much negativity pops up in a year, two years, three years, five years, you'll notice that your new first thoughts are positive and not negative anymore. We can repattern our brain by noticing it and by taking control of it. You can't control your first thought, but you can always control your second thought. And then what do you do? It's very simple. Right now, am I okay? In this moment, this very second, I am okay. Okay, good. Number two, accept. Accept. Stop resisting. The world is the way that it is. And the more that I resist, the worse I'm going to feel. So if I can just accept, I'm going to feel better. And number three, ask yourself this question. This is something that I had. Um, I was feeling a lot of, it's probably about five years ago. I got off a plane and flew into to Austin 
and uh and, and it was like i came from florida and florida was hot and it was amazing and i was on the beach and i flew back into austin and it was like 19 degrees and just like it wasn't even snowing it was like that really frozen rain and it was cold and it was hailing and it was just a crap day outside and i got off the plane and i was like oh gross this is disgusting i'm waiting for my uber to come pick me up and it's like the wind is just like howling it's like 30 miles an hour it's cold it, i came from amazing beautiful florida to cold rainy windy wet austin and i started to notice my feelings changed towards being in Austin at that moment. I didn't feel good. I was like, damn it, why didn't I just stay? And I started to get really kind of anxious about why don't I just stay in Florida? I could have stayed in Florida for an extra week, whatever it was. And then I made myself reframe what was going on. And I asked myself this question. This is a question I have for you is what's beautiful about this moment? And I forced myself to answer what was beautiful about this moment. And so I looked around and I, I started noticing different things that I could feel that were beautiful. Oh my gosh, I have my health. I have you know, people who love me in my life. I have, you know, a business that I love running. I have things that I love doing. I have, you know, uh, a time tomorrow to go work out with one of my best friends. And I started noticing what's beautiful about the moment. And by noticing that thing that I felt was beautiful, I was actually starting to unravel all of the feelings of anxiety and stress that I had about coming back in to the way that it is in the cold and the rain and the sleet and the snow and all of the crap that we had that day. And so a thing I want you to do is number, number one, ask yourself, am I okay? Number two, accept it. And number three, ask yourself this, this one question. What is beautiful about this moment? And reframe your thoughts in the current moment, the current present that's being stolen from you, and reframe it to finding what's beautiful in your life and what's beautiful in this present moment. And this right here that I'm going to share with you is a strategy that I've used for tons of my clients before in the past. And it's actually a strategy I've used for myself. And it's actually a strategy. The reason why I'm talking about it is because it's a strategy I had to use for myself at 4 a.m. in the morning a few days ago. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever done this before where you wake up in the morning. It's early in the morning. Maybe you have to go to the bathroom or you hear noise or dogs are barking or something like that. And then immediately a thought comes through of something that needs to be done or something that you have to do, or it could be an anxious thought. I don't know what it is for you, but that first thought gets your brain going. And then once your brain gets going, it's gone. You can't, you can't stop it. And so uh, a few nights ago, we've been super, super busy in my business this week. Uh, we have an event that we're planning, which we'll tell you about later. We have a mastermind that we're planning that's coming up as well, a three, another three-day event. We have uh, tons of other amazing things that are coming up, and it's all good stuff. But the problem is I woke up to go to the bathroom, and immediately one thing that I had to do popped into my head. And then it was a cascade of all of these different things. Oh my gosh, I'm behind on doing this. I've got to reach out to this person. I've got to get a quote for this. I've got to get this, this, I have to negotiate this price. And it started to become all of these anxious thoughts rolling into my head. One of the things that's very, uh, that's a huge misconception is because I'm a, a mindset guy that I must have this perfect mindset and nothing holds me back but nothing could be further from the truth. The reason why I, I am the quote unquote mindset guy is because I have to work on my mindset sometimes more than other people just to motivate myself to get shit done. And so what happened was I had the first thought, I had the second thought, third thought, and I was sitting in bed for about 45 minutes. So it's about four o'clock in the morning, right? I'm in bed and I'm like, I'm not falling asleep. It's not happening. And I was like, I have to get up and I have to use my strategy on myself. And I had to get up and I had to get my journal. So I went into the living room, I got my journal, four o'clock in the morning and I started journaling some of the stuff that I needed to. And I'm gonna take you through exactly what it is that I did for myself and what I've done for many other clients as well. You know, I've worked with a lot of different people that have anxiety problems. Um, and this is just one of the strategies I've come up with. And the first thing is the awareness that I'm having anxious thoughts. That's the first thing, right? Like the first thing is, is now you have to, you're inside of your head, you're having anxious thoughts, you're inside of your head, you're having anxious thoughts. You've got to pause and notice as the observer, what's going on here. Oh, okay. Yep. I've done this before. I know exactly where I am. I'm in the middle of anxious thoughts. I need to then remove myself outside of my head. You know, it's like the quote, when you, when you take yourself, uh, if you don't take yourself out of the jar, you can't read the label. Uh, inside of the jar is inside of my head. I need to take myself out of my own head, become the observer and say, what is actually happening here? Oh, too many thoughts, too many anxious thoughts. And uh, one of the things that uh, about anxiety is that anxiety comes from your thoughts. 
And when you Google and actually start to look up and research anxiety, there is no cure for anxiety. And the reason why is because it comes from your thoughts. There's no actual, hey, you have anxiety. This is the chemical that you should take. Now, I will tell you this. People do have that you can go to a doctor and if you have too much anxious thoughts, they will give you stuff to then make you feel different and put different chemicals into your brain. But it's not a chemical imbalance. Right. So I've had anxiety attacks before in the past. It's been a long time since I've, that's happened. I've been around many people in the middle of anxiety attacks. I've worked with many people who have anxiety. Some of them that have such crippling anxiety, they literally cannot even leave their house. Their social anxiety is so high that they haven't left their house in two to three years. And the reason why is because it all comes from the thoughts. And when thoughts are in your head, they're extremely hard to deal with. Right. It's like trying to grab water. Like when your thoughts are in your head and you're trying to work through thoughts, it's like trying to grab onto water. Like you will never really grab it. It's always going to get away from you, right? So thoughts can't stay in your head because thoughts are too abstract. You need to get all of your thoughts and put them on paper because to try to wrangle up your thoughts and to try to figure out what's going on and figure out how to work through them is like trying to punch somebody in the dark. Like you're not going to see that person. And maybe every once in a while you take four or five, six swings and on the hundredth swing, you might hit that person, but then they're gone again and they move. That's kind of like figuring out your thoughts in your own head. And too many times people are trying to figure out their issues. They're trying to figure out what's going on in their head. They're trying to figure out why they feel the way that they feel. They're trying to figure out why they're sad, why they're depressed, why they're anxious, why their life isn't going the way that they want to, but they never get a freaking pen and paper and write down what's actually going on. Right. So I sat down with my journal and I wrote down a few questions, right? If you have ever learned how to journal from me before in the past, it's super simple. You just ask yourself questions and then you force yourself to answer it. So I was writing down and I, I noticed that I was having anxious thoughts. So I said, what am I having anxious thoughts about? And I just wrote them down and there was like 17 things. It was like a massive list of all of these things just started flooding through because I had so much I had to be like, so much was on my plate. So many plates were spinning at one time. It's kind of what happens sometimes when you grow a biz business and you know, the higher you go, the harder the wind blows, right? The wind was blowing hard this morning, this, th that morning. And so the first thing I wrote down is what am I having anxious thoughts about? And I wrote all of the different things down and I just, you know, brain dumped, put them all down. Okay. I've got to do this for this person, this for this person, this thing has to happen. You know, I uh, got to make sure that I plan all my podcast episodes. I've got to record all the podcast episodes, this, 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 all of these things. I put them all down on a piece of paper, right? Then what I did is I took each individual one and started working through it, right? I started working through each individual one and then helped myself come up with a plan. And so let me show you how this works. So next time you feel some anxiety now, I, this isn't going to help you in the middle, going to help you in the middle of a panic attack. I promise you that because by the time you're in a panic attack, you're already too far. Like you're too far. You just have to wait till that calms down. But if you feel just anxious thoughts, you feel sad, you don't feel right. This is something that you could use. So you write down and say, what am I feeling anxious about? What am I not liking? What am I fearing right now? Whatever it is that, that's there in front of you, you write it down. You take it out of your head. You put it on that piece of paper, right? The next thing that you ask yourself, is what's the worst that could happen? Now you might think this is not a good question to ask somebody who's in the middle of having anxious thoughts, but it is because I'm gonna show you exactly why that is, right? So what's the worst that could happen? The next question is what's the best that can happen, right? Cause I wanna contrast the worst that can happen. And then the last step is what, last question is what is my next best step to make me feel better right now, right? So let's go through those questions and talk about why they're important and exactly how to work through them, okay? You write down the question, what am I feeling anxious about? And you write down all of the things that you might be feeling anxious about, all of those, right? We all have things that can pop up in the back of your head. We all have busy moments. We all have stressful moments. We all have sad moments in our life. But what we're doing by actually writing it down and not letting it be on the, you know, in our head anymore, we're putting on a piece of paper is we're basically in that room trying to punch somebody in the dark and we flip the lights on and we're like, oh, they're right there. I see him. That alone, 90% of the time makes somebody go, okay, it's on a piece of paper. I feel so much better about it because it's not abstract anymore. It's there. It's, it's, it's literally tangible. I can see it on that piece of paper. Usually that starts the relief. And a lot of times people don't know what's making them feel anxious. And so when they're able to take it, put it down and identify it, it already just by writing it down makes them feel so much better, right? So that's the first thing. 
let's identify. Maybe it's one thing, maybe it's 17 things like it was for me, right? Now let's go into what's the worst that could happen. Here's why this is important, is because when you don't put it on paper and you're dealing with it abstractly, your brain makes up these fears that are completely illogical and, and are ridiculous, right? Oh my gosh, if I don't, you know, end up getting this done, I'm going to lose my house and my kids and my family. And like, that's where your brain immediately goes to the worst possible outcome. So I'm going to put down the, what's the worst that could happen so that I can literally see it and go, oh my God, that's ridiculous. That's never going to happen, right? Because 99.9% .9 of the time, it never gets as bad as your brain actually makes it before you put on a piece of paper. So when you write down what's the worst that could happen and it's like, oh, I could lose my job and my family could be homeless and my kids could be homeless and my wife could divorce me and I could be a terrible father. And then you look at it and you're like, uh, yeah, but that's not going to happen. Like that's, that's ridiculous. And usually that's what happens when you actually take it and put it down on paper and you see it, you identify, you once again, flip the lights on so that you can see what's going on in your head. So what's the worst that could happen? I want to identify that and I want to get clear on what that is. Because then I can go, ah, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. All right, let's go to the next step. What's the best that can happen, right? So let's look at it positively. So if I'm up all night, I'm going, okay, like for instance, we have this event that's coming up. I have to get the event, the contract, the, the AV video team. I've got to negotiate all that stuff. I've got to get the, the place figured out. You know, we've already got it. I've got to get the contract signed, all of that stuff. We've got to get the audio video team completely separate. Got to get them negotiated, get the contract done for them. Then I start thinking about all the things that I'm planning. And the worst that could happen is that it doesn't happen, right? And that would suck, but it's not, the world's not going to end. The best that could happen is we have, you know, a bunch of people show up to it. Everybody gets there safely. They feel amazing. They're able to make new connections and a hundred lives are impacted, right? That's pretty damn exciting. And so now I'm looking at the what's the worst that could happen and going, ah, that's probably not going to happen. And then I'm looking at what's the best that could happen. And I actually feel better about this thing that I was having anxious thoughts about that kept me awake for a while, right? Usually it doesn't go as good as you think it's going to go, but it goes way, 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 way better than the worst that could happen, right? If there's like a medium ground, and, and the worst is all the way over to the right and the best is all the way over to the left, usually in that medium ground, it's going to swing a little bit much more towards the left than is the right. So I want to actually identify what is the best thing that could happen through this. Like, so if you're in the middle of a divorce and that divorce, obviously you don't want to go through, that sucks. I can't even understand what that would feel like to go through something like that, right? But you could go, what's the worst that could happen? You can work through it and you say, what's the best that could happen? Well, we go through this divorce, we go our separate ways, and I become a free person again. I can refind myself because I felt like I lost myself in that relationship. And then you're like, oh my God, what can, what, how amazing would it be for me to find myself and who I truly am and who I've grown into because I grew apart from this person. And then maybe you actually get excited about divorce because you're like, that sounds awesome. I do want to get this divorce, right? So it, it can take something that seems positive and turn it into negative, right? So what's the best that could happen is the next question. And then the last question is what is my next best step to make me feel better right now? Right? What is my next best step to make me feel better right now? What action can I take to make me feel better? Right? So for me, what it was, I was like, okay, if I'm looking at all these things, I put down all of the action plans of exactly what I needed to do in all of those 17 categories, all of the stuff that, that I need to do. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I can do this tomorrow morning once, you know, once everybody wakes up and I can get on the phone calls and I can negotiate and do all this stuff. I can get my team on it as well. So I was like, okay, I'm looking at all this stuff. It's four o'clock in the morning, 4.45 in the morning. I can't do anything about it right now for most of these. So what's the next best step for each one of these? Did them, okay, bought it, wrote them all down. Now what I'm gonna do, the next best steps to make me feel better right now. I was like, what's the next best step? I need to meditate and I need to focus on what I'm grateful for. Cause I have so much to be grateful for in my, in my life. Like it's amazing. And I'm focusing on these things that are kind of trivial. And you know, I'm not saying all of people's things that they're stressing out about are trivial, like mine happen to be, but it's not going to ruin my life in these circumstances. So I was like, you know what? I need to focus on gratitude because if I come from a place of gratitude, if I come from a place of love, equanimity, peace, I'm going to go into all of these 17 things and feel better. So I was like, all right, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to focus on gratitude, you know? Maybe for you guys, it might be like, okay, I need to have a conversation with this person. That's the very first thing I need to do right now, right? Maybe it's like, I need to go work out. I need to go for a run, 
I need to call a friend. I need to call my business partner because this thing that happened to us has really been stressing me out and I haven't had the conversation I need to. That's why I'm stressed out. You know what? Screw it. I'm going to have the, the conversation right now, right? Because then what happens is I've identified my anxiety culprit, right? I've shined the light on it. I've identified what could happen, the worst that could happen. I've identified the best that could happen. And now I have the action that I need to take in order to make me feel better. And by doing all of this at literally 4.45, 5 o'clock in the morning, made me feel so much better. And I went from not being able to fall asleep to, okay, I've got everything on a piece of paper. It's all ready to go. As soon as I can start doing work in the morning, I was like, I'm going to put on meditation. I'm going to feel some gratitude. I'm going to try to make myself feel better. And I, 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 I consciously breathed for 20 minutes. And I was consciously... And when I was breathing, I was going, I'm going to feel my body relax with every single out breath. For 20 minutes, I was like, I'm going to consciously feel my body. And I went from this, this high vibrational buzzing state of like, oh my gosh, anxiety, stress, stress, anxiety, to calm, peace, felt amazing. What happened? Fell asleep. I was like, whoa. Wake up a couple hours later on my couch, did my morning routine. I got my journal. I looked at all of the things and then one by one started knocking out every single one of them and had a super freaking productive day and all of the anxiety around everything was gone. All of the stress around everything was gone. Be why? Because it was all in my head. I needed to take it out of my head. I needed to shine a light on it. I needed to work through what's the worst that could happen, the best that could happen, and what is the immediate steps that I need to do right now to make myself feel better. So I woke up, I did my morning routine, I got my journal, looked through all of the stuff that I had, started knocking everything out because I had my action plans. I had exactly what needed to be done. But the most important part was number one, identifying <clears throat> what was going on, <clears throat> excuse me. Then what did I do after that? I actually went, you know what? I'm gonna write it all down. I took it all out of my head and I put it down on a piece of paper, right? Get it out of your head, put it down. So you're not, not trying to grab water anymore. So you're not trying to punch that person in the dark, flip the light on, see the person and go, oh, there it is. That's the thing that I need to work towards. So know that when you're feeling anxious thoughts, there is a strategy to get out of it. This is the four steps, the four questions to ask yourself. Next time you feel stressed, worried, fear, anxiety, any of those negative feelings, I want you to use this, try it, and I guarantee it'll make you feel better. I'm going to give you my number one tip for overcoming anxiety. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's actually way more simple than you could think. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. It's actually, even though it's so ridiculously simple, I know that for a majority of people listening to this, it's going to be really hard for you to actually do this to relieve your anxiety. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. Recently, I've been so freaking busy. I've been spinning so many plates. We have so many events that are coming up. We're hiring new people. We're creating new programs. We're making sure that we give our clients who are currently paying us the best possible experience that they can. I'm on lives, I'm talking to people, I'm coaching people, all of this stuff. It's literally like a rocket ship. And with a rocket ship, it's all good stuff. But if not kept at bay, it can creep up on you to be like a holy shit moment, there's a lot going on and I'm kind of stressed out about it. And for me, I noticed the anxious thoughts starting to creep in. And so that's what I'm gonna tell you is what I've been doing over the past couple of weeks to kind of keep them at bay. But especially not just me, but with all of the stuff that's happening in the world right now, all of the uncertainty of what, what's going on. Is the virus still here? Is it, are we staying in lockdown? We're in lockdown, we're not in lockdown. We're back in lockdown again. Are we wearing masks? We're not wearing masks. Could I die from this? There's so much anxious thoughts that are coming from this. This is going to help so many people if you can just do this. And your brain, even though you're trying to keep it at bay, your brain's constantly in the background thinking, is this happening? Is this not happening? Am I safe? Am I not safe? How should I do this? How should I walk? Should, how should I, am I able to walk up to a person, shake their hand? Are they going to be, and there's so many things, so many variables that are just all over the place for people. I'm going to teach you how to try to keep those things at bay and how to calm them down so that you can operate at the highest level possible for you. And before I tell you my secret, there's one thing that it's going to piss a lot of people off. It's maybe not piss people off. It's going to make you sad. One thing that makes it absolutely worse is caffeine. I said it. Yes, your coffee. If you have anxious thoughts throughout the day, if you feel really way too stressed throughout the day and you're drinking coffee in the morning, it is making it way 
worse, way worse. So I would recommend if you're having anxious thoughts, if you're having, you know, if you're getting anxiety, if you're getting some little bit of feels like you're a little bit depressed or that you're sad or that you're super freaking stressed out, wean yourself off of coffee for a little while, right? If you can't go cold turkey and you got to wean yourself off, switch from, from coffee to when you're making coffee, do half decaf, half caffeinated and try that out for a little while. And if you can't do that, go green tea. Just do something that has less caffeine so it, it, you can start to not be so dependent on it. You'll notice your stress levels, your anxiety levels go down a ton. So let me tell you what I've been doing. It's super simple, but it is ridiculously profound. Once again, just because it's easy and it's simple doesn't mean that it's easy to do and to more, make yourself do. And if you're dealing with anxious thoughts, this definitely won't be easy, but it's worth it. And it works. Here's what it is. I've been breathing. And you guys are listening to me are probably like, no, shit, we all have, right? But I don't mean just breathing. I mean, extremely intentional breathing. And if you've ever been on a live with me before, if you've ever been on a Zoom call, a Facebook live, a live event, I try to start every single meeting that I do. Every single morning when we do our team calls, we start off with breathing. Every single time that we get everyone together for our mastermind, we start all of it with breathing. And I'm going to go much deeper into what I do the reasons why I do this, the science behind it for all of you analytical skeptics that are out there. I'm gonna go through all of these things in just a minute, but I want you to try this with me, okay? We're gonna do something that we've never done before in a podcast. We're gonna to breathe together. And don't turn me off and be like, oh, I know how to breathe. Trust me with this, right? There's a lot of science behind this. If you're hanging out at home or you're in a, a good place, you can close your eyes while you do this. If you're driving your car, don't recommend closing your eyes and breathing with me, but you can still breathe. All of this will take about one minute, okay? Here's what we're gonna do. You and I are gonna do six deep breaths together, okay? Reason why is because there was a, a, a Chinese study that was done not too long ago, and they found that if you do six really deep, slow, intentional breaths, that it can completely change your state because the breathing changes your heart rate and your heart rate changes the, the, the breathing and your heart rate, both of those together, change the hormones that are put into your body. So instead of cortisol and adrenaline, which can be very stressful, it can start to calm yourself down and give you some dopamine, some oxytocin, some serotonin, the things that start to calm you down. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna breathe in through the nose. You don't need to do it with me yet. I'll count it with you. We're gonna breathe in through the nose. And when we exhale, we're gonna exhale through the mouth. Now, when you do this on your own, it's really important to try to make your inhale and your exhale as long as you possibly can. And so when you do it, you could breathe in the nose and go, and then breathe out and go, if you wanted to. But actually what you want to do is you want to try to take your lips and make the smallest hole that you possibly can and breathe out. And that will actually slow down the breathing process. And there's a fact, it's literally a fact that when you, you start to do a long exhale, that it actually makes your, your heart start beating slower. And when your heart starts beating slower, obviously that will calm you down. We're not gonna do that, you can do it if you want to, but in a typical time, when you're doing these 60 breaths, it'd, it'd be more of and you just let it out as slow as you possibly can. But for time's sake, just breathe with me instead. We're going to do a little bit different. Okay. So if you can do it, close your eyes. If you can't close your eyes, don't close your eyes, but I'm going to count you through. All you got to do is just breathe with me. So inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. So inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, and last one, inhale, And exhale. Okay, how do you feel? Do you feel a little bit better? Do you feel a little bit calmer? Do you feel a little bit less anxious? 
a little bit less stressed, right? It's literally just breathing, but it is intentional breathing is obviously what's important. Now, here's the important things as, as you go through this. What we didn't do is we didn't even go a little bit more advanced. The more advanced is when you breathe in, I want you to breathe in to your stillness. Find the stillness that you can in your breathing in. And in your exhale, what I want you to do is I want you to breathe out the bullshit. Breathe out the stress. Breathe out the worry. Breathe out the to-do list. Breathe out the thoughts. Breathe out all of those things. I want you to just try to connect to the stillness that is inside of you. Do you feel different? I know if you did it right, you probably do. Even if you didn't do it right, you probably still feel different. Slow, intentional breathing has been shown scientifically to reduce anxiety and depression inside of people. Don't underestimate the power of your breathing. Now I'm gonna go deeper into telling you guys what I've been doing just besides that to help you guys out with the anxiety and anxious thoughts and stress and worrying and all that stuff. But if you just look at what's important to humans, right? Like food, for instance, you cannot eat food for weeks. You can go without food for weeks and still live. Water, you can go a couple days without water, but breath, maybe a couple minutes. So if we're ranking breath, water, food on the importance scale, what's the most important? Clearly breath is. Breath is the first thing to change whenever your state changes. When you get excited, it's clinically shown that the very first thing to change in somebody during excitement is the breath inside of somebody. When you get anxious feelings, when you feel anxiety, the very first thing to change in you before your hormones, before your thoughts, any of those things is your breath. When you feel fear, the very first thing to change inside of you is your breath. And so what do we do is if we want to change our own state, we intentionally change our breathing to intentional breathing. And that's how you bring your body back to normal. Since I've been telling you, I've been so freaking busy and a little bit anxious and stressed out over the past week. How have I been using this? I've been sitting down and forcing myself to not just do six deep breaths, but to do this as long as possible until I can feel that the anxious thoughts, the stress, the worry, the fear, whatever's popping up in my head is going away until I feel different. And if I'm being honest with you, it usually takes about 20, 25, 30 minutes to feel this way. This is the hard part about it. This is why people have so much struggle to meditation is because there's so much anxiety that comes up, so many anxious thoughts, the to-do list, the fears, all of those things come up. And it's basically like your subconscious, your ego fighting against you to, you know, the, the easiest way to think about it is if you put a child to bed, the little kid will fight and fight and fight to going to bed, even though they're, they, they need to go to bed and they're wanting to go to bed and they're angry and they're crazy because they are so tired, they fight to not go to bed. And that fighting and staying up makes them even more angry and even more emotional. That's exactly what happens when you sit down, when you're anxious and you try to meditate. All of the anxious feelings will do everything that they can to make you not sit down and meditate. And so what you wanna do when you sit down, I literally have been doing this every morning for about 25 minutes and I can feel myself starts to get even more anxious during the first 5, 10, 15 minutes of meditation. And then eventually my body kind of calms down and it's like, okay, we're not going to do this. We're going to chill. And so what you want to do is you can either feel the breath going in your nose and out of your mouth, in your nose, out of your mouth, and just pay attention to that feeling. Or what I've been doing is feeling the muscles around my stomach. I can feel the muscles on my stomach. When I breathe in, I can feel them go out around my diaphragm. And when I breathe out, I can feel them going in. And all I say is, breathing in, in my head, I'm saying breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out. And your mind will wander. It'll go all over the place. It'll try to fight. It'll try to say, no, this isn't what you should be doing. But just like, you know, like I, I know that for, for our puppy, he goes crazy sometimes. He bites Toby and Toby's 12 years old and our puppy's eight years old, eight months old. And he goes crazy on him and we have to train him not to do those types of things. So what we'll do is we'll hold him in place and be like, no, that's not what you do. And he'll fight and he'll fight and he'll fight and he'll fight and fight. And eventually he's like, <sighs> and he literally does a breath. If you've ever noticed when your dog goes to lay down, what do they do? They go, <sighs> and they breathe out. That's what dogs do to calm themselves down. So you have to realize that you have to sit there and you have to fight through the anxious feelings because you're going to feel more anxious when you sit down to breathe, promise you that. And so what I do is I do this breathing, slow in through the nose, slow out through the mouth for 15, 20, 30 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes at a time. And I can feel myself fight it and 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 fight it. And eventually it's like, and it just kind of gives out. And what am I doing? I'm destroying the anxious thoughts. 
I'm getting rid of the anxious thoughts. I'm getting rid of the stress. I'm getting rid of the fear. I'm getting rid of the worry. Anything that's going through my mind, I'm telling my mind, I will not allow you to act the way that you're acting. Because anxiety and stress and worry and fear all come from your thoughts. They do. And so I'm telling my mind, I'm not going to allow you to do this. I'm not going to allow you to do this. I'm not going to allow you to do this. And it's going to fight and it's going to fight. It's going to fight. It's going to fight. And it's going to go, all right, fine. And it might take 15 to 20 minutes to even get to the, all right, fine. But if you don't want to feel anxious anymore, then that's just something that you need to do. It's not that you don't have enough time. It's just that you're not willing to do it. Don't ever say that I don't have enough time. Just say it's not a priority, right? So if you're wanting to stop being so anxious, if you're wanting to calm down, if you're wanting to stop worrying, it comes from your, your breath because your breath is in charge of every feeling that you have. And you break through those feelings. And that's what you're trying to conquer is those anxious thoughts, the worry, the stress, the fear, the feelings. You're just trying to get all of those to subside. And eventually you'll find a place where you'll be in and it might take you some time. But you'll go, you know what? I feel pretty good. I feel like this breathing exercise is done. You don't even have to call it meditation because I guess it's not even meditation. It can be if you want it to be. Or you can just say, you know what? I'm just going to breathe. I'm not going to put any time to it. All I'm going to do is I'm going to wait until my anxious thoughts, my stress, my worries, my fears, all of those things subside. And then I'm going to give myself a few minutes to rest in that peace and know that I can always come back to this peace. And when you do this, you'll realize that your day is completely different completely different. So you do this when you first wake up, because that's usually when your cortisol is at the highest, which means you're stressing out, which means that you're worried, that you have anxious thoughts. That's when it's the highest for me. Cortisol is usually actually what wakes you up and cortisol is the stress hormone. So I feel it in the morning. So I force myself to calm down. I force myself. I'm going to be the one that's in charge of my brain. I'm not going to let my brain be able to do whatever it wants to do. I'm going to wrangle it and I'm going to make it calm down and I'm going to get rid of my anxious thoughts, my feelings, my worry, my stress by simply going back to the breath. This is something that you can do at any moment, at any time, anywhere in the world throughout the day. This is something that will make you more powerful because when you can control your mind, you can control everything else around you. But once again, it's so simple, but it's not easy. You've got to force yourself to do it and you've got to know. Last thing I'll say, you've got to know that your mind is going to fight you for a little while and it's going to be really freaking hard to stay still. You've got to go against those feelings. And eventually, like a child who's just fighting not to go to bed, eventually they're gonna fall asleep. And eventually your feelings are gonna subside. Energy should be one of the most important things that you think about every single day. How much energy you have, because we only have 24 hours every single day. You have 24 hours, I have 24 hours, everybody has 24 hours. The life that you have and the life that you will create is dependent upon what you do in that time. But if you don't have energy, it's like living your life like you're driving a, you know, an 18 wheeler. Have you ever seen an 18 wheeler try to get going? It takes a while. It takes a while. It takes a while. When in reality, if you plan, a plan, a plan and pay attention to your energy throughout the day, you can get your body to move like a Ferrari. So if I were to say, hey, life is a race. Would you like an 18 wheeler or would you like a Ferrari? You're probably going to pick the Ferrari, right? Why? Because it goes faster. So let's talk about, I'm going to give you four key topics we're going to dive into pretty in depth today as far as energy goes as to why most people are tired, but then also if you pay attention to these and really plan them out, these will all help you have more energy throughout the day. So four key factors. Number one, obviously, is going to be sleep. So let's dive into sleep. Uh, we're going to talk about ways to sleep better, and we're also going to talk about how to stay awake better as well. So first thing that you want to think about when you wake up in the morning, some, some of you wake up when the sun is already up. Some of you guys wake up after the sun, before the sun is up. Some of you guys wake up after the sun is up. And the first thing that you want to do is when the sun comes out in the morning, you want to try to get sun on your skin and you want to get it on as much of your skin as possible. So if you happen to live, you've got nowhere near you, get butt ass naked, go outside, get some, get some sunlight, make sure the kids aren't around on your body. The more that you can get on you, the better. Don't get a sunburn or anything like that. If you live in downtown Miami, but the sun comes up and it hits you on your balcony, don't get butt naked on your balcony and then blame it on me. You know, go out there in your bathing suit, get some sun on your skin. There's a couple reasons why this is important. Number one, the sun on your skin tells your brain to stop making melatonin. And I'm going to give you another tip on that as well. And number two, it sets your circadian cycle, which is the sleep cycle that you have. So you want to get out and actually get the sun on your skin for just a few minutes. It doesn't have to be anything too long. 
The second thing that you want to do while you're out there as well, you may have heard me talk about this before, is to go and actually look at the blue in the sky. So you don't want to look at the sun itself, you want to look at the blue. The receptors in your eye, when they see that blue, what they do is they stop making melatonin as well. Now, let me give you a secret. Uh, for those of you guys that are out there and you have SAD, which is uh, seasonal effectiveness disorder, which I found that I have, when it's gloomy for a while, you notice, like I can usually tell what the weather is when I wake up um, before, because if I feel like I'm dragging ass and it's hard for me to get out of bed, there's a pretty good chance, uh, like it is today in Austin right now. It's kind of rainy. It's not the, the most beautiful day. But if I jump out of bed and it's easier for me to get out of bed, usually there's not a cloud in the sky. So some people are affected by, this, the, by the clouds, some people aren't. It depends on who you are. There's a thing called the Philips Blue Light, and there's other companies that make these as well, but I know the one that I have is called the Philips Blue Light. And what you want to do is if you notice, if you live in a place with some really long winters or doesn't get a whole lot of sun, what you do is you take this thing and you actually put it in the corner. You don't look directly at it, but if you're going to sit there and work on your computer, you put it off to the side and your eyes will start to actually see that blue, which tells the melatonin to stop being made in your brain, which then allows you to wake up and have more energy. Um, so another thing you wanna do when you talk about the blue is you want to try to, when the sun starts to set, you wanna to try to remove as much blue from your environment as possible. So the first thing that you gotta think about is your phone. Your phone has a whole hell of a lot of blue. There's something called night shift on iPhone, Samsung's, all the other phones, I don't, Androids, I don't know what they're called. But night shift, when the sun starts to set, it starts to take the blue and turn it more into red. Why is this important? Well, the same reason why blue makes you wake up in the morning is the same reason why blue makes you stay awake in the evening. So you want to start removing blue from your environment. Another thing that you need to do, you need to start thinking about your computer. If you have a MacBook, I have a MacBook. There's something that's free. It's called Flux, F-L dot, what is it? F dot lux flux same exact thing as night shift is when it is the sun starts to set it knows where you are in the world it will actually start to change the blues in your screen to red which then allows you it makes it easier to fall asleep um, this is the reason why you see so many people wearing blue blockers at night when they're starting to go to bed it's because if you're watching tv if you're walking around your house these blue blockers those glasses tend to take the blue out of your your vision so it allows you to fall asleep better because most of the time humans 100,000 years ago, we're not staying up at 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. They were going to bed a little bit after the sun went down, right? So you, you have a, a couple different things. Number one, you have night shift on your phone. You have flux on your MacBook. You have blue blockers as well. Um, you want to try to get away from your phone. You want to try to get away from your TV uh, 30 minutes to an hour before you're going to go to bed. And here's one thing that I don't really hear many people talk about is you also want to stay away from overhead lights. So in my house, we have lights literally built into the ceiling, right? You want to try to stay away from those at night. And the reason why is because you actually have receptors on the bottom of your eyes that actually notice that there's light above your head, which your brain thinks is what? The sun. And so at night, you actually don't want to have overhead lighting on. You want to have lamps that are on the ground about eye level or lower that are actually producing light that you have at night. So what you're doing is you're tricking your brain into thinking, hey, you know, it's about time to go to bed so that you can fall asleep. You can get better REM sleep. You can get better deep sleep as well. Um, turn off the overhead lights. Get rid of all the blue as much as you possibly can. Next thing when we dive into sleep itself is make sure that your room is as black as you possibly can make it. Like if you can make it so you can't see your hand in front of your face at night, that's perfect. You want it to be that way. And the reason why is because you actually have photoreceptors on your skin and those photoreceptors are basically like little eyes. So even if your eyes are closed, your skin, the photoreceptors on your skin still know that there's light out there. So you want to try to make your room as dark as possible. Do not... I know there's some people out here. I'm going to, I'm going to disappoint you. You probably already know the answer to this anyways. You aren't, you know, you shouldn't be watching. You shouldn't have the freaking TV on when you're going to bed. It's not good for you. Uh, number one, the photoreceptors in your eyes are still noticing that there's light inside of the room. So it's going to mess your sleep up. And as well, it's going to, <clears throat> you know, it's going to, um, as you're hearing it, it's going to keep your brain semi awake because your brain, even when you're asleep is still listening the whole time that you're asleep. Like if you're asleep, deep sleep and you hear a loud bang in your house, it's going to wake you up. That's because your brain is still awake. So if you're listening to, if your brain is listening to the TV all night long, it's going to be keeping you out of REM sleep and out of deep sleep and not getting the sleep that you need to. Therefore, you're not going to have the energy that you need to. If you have to fall asleep with something on, get a fan, you know, get some white noise machine. 
Uh, my dog snores like crazy. He snores louder than the average human. Toby, 12 years old, snores louder than anybody I've ever met. I have to have a white noise machine or else I don't sleep when he's inside the room. So we have a white noise machine inside of our room, right? Next thing you think about as well, your bed. Your bed, does it suck? One of the things that people don't invest enough money into is their bed. Reason why is because they're cheap, I don't know. But, but the reason why it's important is because of the fact that you spend one third of your life, right? The average person sleeps for eight hours a night. If you sleep for eight hours, that is one third of the 24 hours that you have in a day. Right? So one third of your life is spent on a bed. Make sure that you have a really good bed that gets you into REM sleep, that gets you into deep sleep. There's tons of different, you know, Apple watches now and um, beds that, that measure it. And aura, there's a thing called an aura ring, uh, uh, whoop. All of these things measure your sleep at night. And so you can measure them to actually see if you really want to get deep into it and see how you're sleeping and, and start to get down to it and get nerdy on it. You can get really nerdy on how well you're sleeping. So if you want to have more energy, the first thing you got to think about is how is your sleep, right? If you have no energy throughout the day, it might be because you're just not taking the right measures when you fall asleep, okay? That's the first thing I think about always with energy, obviously asleep. Second thing, obvious, diet. What are you eating throughout the day, right? Digestion is the most energy consuming thing that your body does. There is nothing more that your body does that's more energy consuming than digestion. So. If you're eating stuff that's very heavy, that's very greasy, that's very fatty, that's fast foods, you're not going to have energy. And the reason why is because your body is using the energy and shutting everything else down so that it can get this food out of your body because it's like, we gotta get this out, right? So what are you eating throughout the day? You know, if you're eating a heavy breakfast, if you're eating a heavy lunch, if it's greasy, if it's fast food, all these things that I said, it's gonna be slowing you down. Another thing to think about that a lot of people don't think about as well is have you done an allergy test to see if you have any food allergies? Because if you have food allergies, that's your body going, there's something that's an emergency, we've got to get it out, and it's going to use as much energy as it can to get rid of whatever it is that you're allergic to. So what type of food are you eating? Normally, what ends up being the best for people, food that they eat throughout the day to try to give you the most energy, you know, you can do uh, leafy greens, light greens, Maybe some chicken on top of it, whatever it is that works for you. Maybe some, you know, beans and corn on top of it. Whatever it is that, that will give you energy. Everybody's body is different. So what gives me energy might take energy away from you and vice versa. So what does your energy look like throughout the day after you eat? When you have lunch, are you tired after lunch? That's something that you should eliminate from your diet if you're tired after lunch. So start paying attention to the things that make you tired, right? Um, normally what I like to have throughout the day, a shake. It's just easy. Gets down, easy to digest. I get a lot of nutrients from it. I'm good to go for it throughout the rest of the day. Usually my biggest meal is at dinner. I just do that because I usually have a lot more energy throughout the day if I eat less. That's just the way it happens to be for me. And I had a, an interview that's coming out pretty soon with Dr. David Sinclair. Dr. David Sinclair is the head of aging at Harvard. And uh, we were talking about the whole thing and you know just the stuff that you eat throughout the day. And he s recommends you skip at least one meal per day. Number one, it'll make you live longer. And number two, it'll also give you a lot more energy, right? So if we're talking about diet as well, another thing to think about is caffeine. Uh-oh, I'm about to offend a whole lot of people. Here we go. In case you didn't know, the half-life of caffeine is seven hours. What does half-life mean? Half-life means it takes the half, if, if I have 100 milligrams of, ca uh, of caffeine, right? the half-life would be how long does it take for it to be half of the amount? So from 100 milligrams to 50 milligrams. What's crazy is that the half-life of caffeine is five to seven hours. So if you are a late caffeine drinker, so let's say I have a coffee at 4 p.m., that means at 11 o'clock at night, half of that caffeine is still in my body, right? So at 11 p.m., my 4 p.m. coffee, half of that is still in my body and hasn't gotten released yet. So you have to think it to yourself, if I wanna be able to sleep better, I should probably start paying attention to the caffeine that I have and the caffeine intake that I have. Once again, half-life of five to seven hours. So I recommend, and what I always say is, you know, one o'clock is probably the latest that you should have some form of caffeine. Uh, if you've been listening to my podcast long enough, you've heard me talk about it. I really don't drink a whole lot of coffee anymore, even though I love coffee. What I have switched to is yerba mate, reason why I switched to yerba mate is because caffeine, the coffee caffeine, when you drink coffee, there's a massive spike in caffeine and then you know the coffee drops. When you have a couple hours later, the it just drops and your energy drops. So you might have a massive spike and a massive drop and that's why you don't have energy throughout the day. If you do want to have caffeine, 
instead of having it in coffee, if you have it in something like yerba mate and some other types of tea, yerba mate, everybody always sends me a message and asks Y-E-R-B-A space M-A-T-E. That's yerba mate. Uh, your liver digests, your liver and your body digests it differently than coffee. And so instead of a massive spike and a massive drop, it's a massive spike. And then it takes about five hours for your body to drop that. So instead of having a massive drop, it's a lot easier of a drop. So something to think about, think about the caffeine when you're taking it, when you're not taking it. Um, and remember five to seven hour half-life is caffeine inside of your body. So last thing I think about as well, or sorry, the, the third thing I think about, second to last thing I think about uh, is exercise. The more that you exercise, even though it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, the more energy that you use inside of exercise, the more your body will actually start to make more energy. So if you start exercising a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, your body will start to make more energy every single day, right? So if you're somebody who's very tired throughout the day, you don't have a whole lot of energy. One of the questions I'm gonna ask you is how much do you exercise? What kind of force do you put through your, your body through? And what do you do throughout the day? Um, if you exercise more, your body's gonna create more energy. Find out when your best time to create more energy is for you. So for me, Working out, 9 a.m., 10 a.m. is usually my favorite time to work out. I have the opportunity to do so because I have my own business and I work from home. It might be the same for you, it might not be the same for you, but when do you get the most energy to work out? When is your best time to work out? You should figure that out. Maybe it's six o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning for you, maybe it's noon, maybe it's 6 p.m. Find out when the best time is for you to make sure that you're staying consistent with your exercise. If you're tired throughout the day, there's a pretty good chance that you're not working out enough. And your body runs more efficiently whenever you start to work out as well. And it also helps you fall asleep and it also helps you sleep better, which in turn helps you get more energy as well. So think about your exercise, how much you're exercising. And the last thing I think about as far as why people are tired is your environment. Your environment will make you tired as well. Think about the people that you surround yourself with. Do they give you energy? Do they strip energy away from you? If you're around them for a half an hour, do you feel more energized or do you feel like crap after you're done with them? Right? So what does your environment look like? Okay. Second thing, what does your job look like? If you hate your job, I promise you this, it is stealing energy and sucking energy out of you. It's also sucking your soul away. Probably if you hate your job, right? That's the way I felt when I hated my job is it was like just soul sucking to be, to be there when I was younger and I was at a job, right? So the job you have can be stealing your energy away from you. Maybe your coworkers at your job are stealing your energy away from you, right? Um, do you sit all day long? Think about that. Uh, one of the things that, that they recommend is getting up and going for a walk, even if it's three or four minutes, every single hour, get your body moving. If you're not moving a lot throughout the day, your body's going to make less energy. So if you don't have a whole lot of energy throughout the day, are you sitting most of the day, right? Let's talk about how to make energy on demand real quick. One of the things that I've been doing a lot lately, I found it from one of my friends that we did it during a workout, is this thing called ski breaths. And what you do is you breathe in through the nose and you breathe out through the mouth. But when you breathe in, you take your hands in a fist, you put them above your head. And when you breathe out, you breathe out and push down as if you're like a skier, right? So it's, for those of you guys listening on the podcast, you don't know what the hell I'm doing. For those of you guys watching on video, and you do it over, but you do it aggressively. Hands up, breath, breathe in through your nose, hands down, you breathe out through your mouth and you do it over and over and over again. Do that for a minute and two minutes. You're going to be out of breath. It'll make your heart go like crazy and it will wake you up. That is how you get your body to wake up, to force yourself to make more energy. So if you feel like you're, if you feel like it's three o'clock and you're dragging ass and you're not getting as much done, you still have a lot to do for the day, but you know, oh my gosh, I can't drink coffee because I won't fall asleep tonight. Force your body through movement and through breath to give you energy on demand. Your body is a beautiful thing. If you need energy, you can force your body to trick itself to create energy. If like, you know, if, we, if it was 100,000 years ago and you and I are really tired and we're walking through wherever the hell we live 100,000 years ago and uh, you and I are on a walk and a cheetah pops out of the bush and starts chasing us, we won't be like, oh, I'm too tired. You know, no, your body's gonna click in. It's gonna force itself to make energy. So how can you trick your body to exactly the same? One of the ways through these ski breaths Works so well, breathe in through the nose, put your arms above your head, breathe out through your mouth, push them down as if you're skiing on, you know, snow. Um, get the heart rate up, move more. Next thing I think as well, as far as your environment goes, how do you talk to yourself in your head? Like, do you tell yourself you don't have energy? Because I promise you this, if you tell yourself, oh, I'm so tired, if you say you're tired to people, if you say it out loud all the time, if you say you're a tired person, say you didn't sleep well, all that stuff, you will feel more tired if you say you're tired. I promise you that. 
So start to think about that. Do you say how tired you are throughout the day? And then also, how do you talk to yourself in your head? Do you build yourself up or do you talk shitty to yourself? If you talk trash to yourself, if you're negative, if you have negative self-talk, I guarantee you that negative self-talk is going to make you feel worse about yourself. It's going to make you feel worse. And in turn, it's going to steal energy away from you. Today, we're going to be talking about the nine ways to naturally have more energy. I'm going to give you some that are going to be decently obvious, but I'm going to give you some tips around how to make them better. And I'm going to give you some that are just going to be something you probably never thought of before. So the first one as how to have more energy is to get some sleep. Now you might be like, well, no, sh well, let's dive deeper into sleep. Uh, sleep is obviously extremely important for your energy, but there's a couple hacks that you can definitely have. Number one, your room should be as dark as possible when you sleep. You should figure out how much sleep you need. For me, it's about seven and a half to eight hours. I can sleep for 13 hours straight if nobody wakes me up though. I just can sleep. But if I'd go too long, then I don't feel good. If I go too short, I don't feel good. So I've come to realize that my natural time is about seven and a half to eight hours, which is common with people, right? Make sure your room is really dark. Usually it helps if you're colder as well. And uh, one of the things that, that helps with sleep is making sure that you keep a very consistent time. You go to bed and you wake up at the exact same times every single night, every single morning during the week and also during the weekend. So it's very important to keep your circadian cycles exactly the same. If you want to research more about circadian cycles and how to help with them, that is definitely one way to do it. Now, one thing that helps with that as well, everybody seems to want to wake up earlier. It's very simple to wake up earlier. Do you want to know how to do it? You just force yourself to wake up. Let's say it's five o'clock. And you're like, but I'm a night owl. I went to bed at midnight. All you got to do is force yourself to wake up at five o'clock. You're going to be more tired that night and you're naturally going to start to fall asleep. So if you wake up at five o'clock and five o'clock and five o'clock, no matter what, your body will change its circadian cycle and start to make you go to bed earlier. A lot of people think that they're night owls. Nobody's really a night owl. Very, very few, like one out of a hundred people out of studies they've done and found that, that people are actually night owls. What happens is it's just the problem is that people are around too many screens, too many screens. They are keeping themselves up. If you were to go, okay, when the sun sets, I'm going to read a book. Try to keep yourself awake if that's what you did every single night. You're going to fall asleep. First thing is sleep. When you wake up, one way that's going to help you when you break your sleep, if you've heard me talk about this before in my podcast, is to walk outside. You go and you look at the blue in the sky because the blue turns off, it turns, we have your receptors in your eyes that tell your brain to stop making melatonin and your brain stops making melatonin, which is the thing that makes you fall asleep so that you wake up earlier. Second thing that you want to do to have more energy, which goes with number one, is to drink some caffeine if that's something that you're into. Now, the secret is to not drink caffeine within an hour of waking up because that's when your cortisol levels are really high. It's best to let your cortisol levels drop and then have caffeine about an hour to two hours after you wake up. So for those of you guys that have a lot of caffeine, uh, this is a secret. Wait about an hour. Along with caffeine is to stop drinking caffeine at about noon if you really want to have good sleep and have more energy. If you want to have a whole lot of energy, you can stop drinking caffeine completely. And eventually after about a month, your body will start creating its own energy. So caffeine is super important in this sense. Also, what type of caffeine you have. It's crazy. I didn't know there's so many different types of ways you can get caffeine. So there's coffee, which you could use, but I'm starting to drink less and less coffee over the past year and a half. And I'm starting to go more towards tea. Tea I drink the most is called yerba mate. People always send me messages saying, Rob, what is that tea that you talk about? It's called yerba mate, Y-E-R-B-A-M-A-T-E. -E. Yerba mate, instead of dehydrating you like coffee does, it actually hydrates you and it's got a lot more nutrients inside of it as well. It's also got a lot of other stuff. Uh, when I was talking with uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who is uh, the neurobiologist out of Stanford, he told me he drinks because because there's a lot of extra things that are benefits for your brain of actually taking your mate versus coffee. So tip number two, obviously is caffeine. Tip number three, take some B12 if you want to. Now I'm not a doctor in any sort of way, so don't listen to anything that I say, but I take B12 sometimes throughout the day to get something natural without having this massive spike of caffeine and then a drop after. So B12 is something that definitely helps as well. Super simple. Tip number four, Stop drinking so much alcohol. Actually, if you really want to help yourself out, stop drinking alcohol, period, if it's something that you could do. I very rarely drink alcohol, but this is something super interesting that happened over the past week. Last week was my girlfriend's birthday. We went out a couple times and I didn't even get drunk at all. I just had a couple glasses of wine and I wear this thing on my wrist when I go to sleep. It's called or during the day, mostly throughout the entire day. And then also when I sleep, it's called a whoop and it literally tracks your body the entire day and it tracks your recovery as well. Something really crazy happened. My recovery 
from having two glasses of wine completely plummeted even though I got more sleep. Three of the nights we went out and we had a couple glasses of wine, like her friends were in town and then we went to San Antonio where she's from and then I had two glasses of wine there. My recovery during sleep got destroyed from two glasses of wine. Alcohol stays in your system for up to 80 hours. That's over three days it will affect you. And so I always knew this, but I was like, I'm gonna have a couple glasses of wine, no big deal. So on the days that I did not, the four nights that I did not drink the two glasses of, of wine, my recovery was around 90 to 94%, which means that I woke up and I had energy. I woke up and I felt good. I woke up and I immediately was like, cool, I can work out, no big deal. What happened was, then I look at my whoop and I saw that every day that I drank, the, the, the night that I drank, my sleep was around a 31 to 35%, which means that I didn't feel anywhere near 100% those days. So if you want to have more energy, don't go home and drink a beer. Don't go home and have a glass of wine. For some of you guys like, but hold on, glasses of wines are actually good for your heart. Well, just so you know, you can go back and listen to my interview that I did with Dr. David Sinclair, who is the head of longevity at Harvard. And he actually says that, uh, I think it's res resveterol, I think is what it's called. The antioxidant that they found that's inside of wine, red wine, that they did a whole article and said, oh my gosh, this is so good for you. They've actually found it's very small amounts and it doesn't really do anything for you. That was just people over promoting that wine is good for you. It's not bad, bad, bad for you if you're gonna drink just one glass of wine, but what you have to realize is this. The thing about alcohol is that it will help you fall asleep easier, but it will make your sleep worse. And the reason why is because it changes your respiratory rate and it also changes your heart rate. The other thing that was interesting when I checked my recovery, every single night that I drank, my normal resting heart rate is about 50 to 55 beats per minute when I'm sleeping. It was literally up to 60 to 70 beats per minute just when I was sleeping after having alcohol, which means my heart rate went up 20 to 30% while I was sleeping. It's not a good thing to have your heart rate be up while you're sleeping. So if you want to have more energy, stop having a glass of alcohol, stop, stop having a glass of wine, stop having a drink when you come home, stop having beer. It is destroying your sleep as well. Number five, put some music in your house. I'm really big. If you ever come over to my house, I'm really big on always playing music. There's always energy and vibration going through my house at all points in time. For me, and I don't know about you guys, like I have favorite songs that just feel like they give me energy. And so one of the hacks that I find with a lot of people that make it super simple is just start putting on music that you like. Don't even put just background music. Put on music that you like throughout your house, while you're driving, while you're at work, wherever you can listen to music. If you have favorite songs, start putting those favorite songs on. Have the vibrations go through your house. We're vibratory beings. We're constantly vibrating at all points in time. That's just what we do. If you look at us, we look like we're solid beings, but really what we are is we're just a vibrating piece of mass with 70 trillion cells that are constantly moving and vibrating as well. And so when you have energy and movement and music going through a room, your body's going to feel it. Your body's going to hear it. You're going to start singing along with it. You're going to start moving your body a little bit more. So a thing that I recommend is to put music on whenever you can have music on, especially if you can put on your favorite music. Tip number six try something called breath work. There are many, many different types of breath work, but this is something that we do with our team every single morning. We have a team meeting every single morning, all of, all hands on, on, on deck, everybody that's on our team comes in and we do breath work every single morning, guaranteed the very first thing that we do. There's multiple different types of breath work you can do. I'll give you three of them that I recommend. We've done all three of them with my team. They enjoy all of them at different times. One of them is called breath of fire. Breath of fire is where you breathe in and breathe out of your nose as fast as you can for as long as you can. And when you don't think you can do it anymore, you just keep doing it. I like to put on music, of course, like I said, and I'll do Breath of Fire. So it's literally. And I'll do it. Sometimes you get some snot flying out of your nose. No big deal. That's just part of the process. That will literally start to invigorate your body. That's Breath of Fire. Another one that, that we do is called Wim Hof. So Wim Hof, but we also do something a little bit separate. Another thing that I learned from Wim Hof, so it's 30 deep breaths in. But then on the 30th breath, you ready? Here's a secret. You breathe in as much as you possibly can. Hold at the top and then force yourself to do as many push-ups as you possibly can before breathing again. This is just something that I do. This is not a recommendation. I don't need you guys passing out and then saying, oh my God, I heard this guy talk about this thing. This is what I do. If you want to try it, you can try it. What I have found, and here's what's crazy, is if I want to just do push-ups right now, I can do about 40 push-ups in a row. Here's what's crazy. If I want to do the breathing exercise, 
and then do my push-ups, I can get about 60, sometimes even more, it, without ever breathing again. And the reason why is because I'm over-oxygenating my body, which is what your body needs, and also your muscles need a lot of oxygen. So I'm over-oxygenating my body, and I'm doing these push-ups. I'm doing it to music, and I'm pumping them out. And I have literally a song that we listen to every single morning. It's called Strobe by Dead Mouse. We put it on, we just crank it out, and we just do the push-up. We do the breathing, and then we do the push-ups. Every single time, that's the very first way that I start my morning before I ever have any coffee, any of that stuff. And I can literally feel my body light up with energy and I feel completely different. If I'm ever feeling drained throughout the day, I do one of these as well. And the third one I'm gonna tell you, I don't know what they're called, I just call them skis. That's what I call them because it literally looks like, so for those of you guys that are watching video, for those of you guys that aren't watching video and listen on the podcast, breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth. Breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth. And when you breathe in, your hands go above your head. And when you breathe out, your hands go below down to your waist. And it's best to stand up and it's And you literally use your entire body as if you're skiing down a mountain and you're putting your, your hands are going up, you're going down. Your hands are going up, going down. When you breathe in, your hands go up. When you breathe out, your, your, your hands go down. Do this for two to three minutes straight with music blaring as well. You can go from no energy to holy sh I have so much energy like that. Simply because you're using the body the way that the body is made to be used. Super simple. So what was that again? Breath of fire <laughs> or Wim Hof. <sighs> or the skis, all of them are different. I use each of them depending on what I'm doing. Try it out, I promise you, at some point in time, you're gonna get a ton of energy from it. See if it works, see if it works. If you're on your phone, chilling on the couch, scrolling through Instagram, you're like, oh my gosh, I gotta get up and do this thing, but I don't really feel like doing this thing. Force your body to do breath of fire or to do the, the push-ups with a breath hold or to do the skis put on some music and I guarantee you it'll just rush energy into your body. Tip number seven, get outside. Take your shoes off, put your feet in the ground and go outside in the sun. For me, every single morning, the very first thing that I do because we have a puppy, he likes to pee all over the place. So I got to get him outside as soon as we wake up in the morning. First thing I do is I put some shorts on, I keep my, my shirt off and I walk outside barefoot and I keep my feet in the grass as long as I possibly can and get as much sun on my body as I possibly can. And I, like I told you, I look up at the sky, the blue in the sky, and I try to get all of the reasons why I should be awake for my body to go, oh yeah, this is the time when Rob should be awake. The sun is now coming up. He's outside, his feet are on the grass. He's getting sun on his skin. He's looking at the blue inside. So that means that the sky is, you know, obviously the, the sun is up. We should stop making melatonin. I'm trying to give my body all of the reasons why I'm supposed to be up right now. Get some sun on your skin. Also with all of the stuff that's been happening with viruses and everything, vitamin D, which is what you get from the sun, is one of the things that kills the viruses the quickest. According to everybody is the people that have a lot of trouble with it tend to have vitamin D deficiencies. And most people have vitamin D deficiencies. Get outside in the sun more, get as much of your skin to be able to, uh, much sun to be able on your skin as possible. And I guarantee it'll help you. Number eight, exercise in the morning. It is a fact that the more that you exercise, your body will start to create more energy. You know, I look at my, one of my friends, my friend, Amy, when she lived here, she doesn't live here anymore. When she lived here in Austin, she was doing like, God, she was doing like five, four to five cycling classes every single day. And everyone was like, how does she have so much freaking energy? She has so much energy, not because she was just blessed with energy. She, she, must, she has so much energy because she has literally for years told her body, this is what we do, this is what we do, this is what we do. And so when she doesn't go and do four cycling classes and she has a day off, of course she's got so much energy. Of course she can keep going. Of course she wants to party until late night because her body knows it needs to create lots of energy. If you've been in a cycle of not working out, not forcing your body to move, your body's learned that you can make it relearn and make it start to create more energy. So work out in the morning, or at least, even if it's not in the morning, just work out at some point in time and force your body to learn it needs to create more energy. Your body is an amazing adaptive piece of machinery. Force it to adapt the way that you want it to adapt. Last but not least is to drink more water and preferably drink spring water like this, if you're looking. Drink spring water, doesn't have to go through a filter. It's coming straight from the earth. It's also in a plastic, or not in a plastic bottle, in a glass bottle. You can do your own research on why plastic isn't good for you and how plastic raises your estrogen, whether you're male or female. But if it comes from a glass bottle, usually ends up being a lot better for you as well. If it's spring water, ends up being a lot better for you as well. But just regardless, just drink more water. It's mind blowing to me how little water people drink considering that your body is 60 to 70% water. One of the things that they found is that most people when they're tired, 
the very first thing you should check is actually if you're dehydrated because a lot of times the first thing to go down as soon as you're dehydrated is your energy. Your body runs off of water. If you don't feel like you have energy, maybe you should see if you got enough water. Drink a lot more water and your body will actually start to filter out all the toxins and at the same time, it'll run more efficient. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the eight things that you need to stop doing when you wake up. Because as we know, the most important part of your day is usually the morning. And so if we can make sure that our morning is as, as perfect as we possibly can, it will set up the rest of the day. So without further ado, let's dive into it. The first thing that you need to stop doing when you wake up in the morning is waking up at different times. One of the things that your body wants to do is your body wants to have a routine. Your body wants to have it wants to be in line with circadian cycles. I'm not going to go into what circadian cycles are, but that's just basically the natural movement of yourself, your body, your sleep, the earth, all of those things. Your body wants a routine. And this includes on the weekends. So there's a lot of people that will email in to me or they'll send me messages on Instagram and they'll say, Rob, I'm trying to have this great morning routine and it's going really well for me. The only problem is it's, it's really hard for me to wake up in the mornings. And I'm like, all right, well, what time do you wake up in the morning? Oh, well, I wake up at 5 a.m., you know, Monday through Friday. Cool. What does your weekend look like? Well, you know, I tend to go out with my friends on the weekends and then I wake up at 9 to 9.30, 10 o'clock sometimes. I'm like, well, the main issue for you is not that you're not able to wake up and to be able to have your morning routines. It's that when you go to bed at five, when you go to bed later, you wake up at 5 a.m. Monday through Friday, but on Saturday and Sunday, you go to bed later. Even if you don't go out and party and get drunk, but you're waking up at 9, 10 a.m., your body does not have a routine. Your body wants to have a routine that it gets into, that it follows, that makes it easier for it. So the very first thing that I would say is stop waking up at different times. Have a very consistent time because once your body starts to get used to it, after about two weeks, after about three weeks, your body will be in a routine, makes it super easy to wake up. And when you get your body into a routine, even for the people who are like, oh, but I'm a night owl. No, you're not. Uh, is actually studies have found that night owls don't exist. It's just that the routine of staying up late has been around for so long you think that you're a night owl. Is that when you start forcing yourself to go to bed earlier to wake up later and come up at this, wake up at the exact same time, your body will start to wake itself up a lot of times even before the alarm. I know every person listening to this has had their body wake up right before the alarm goes off. It's because your body wants to be in a routine. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I want you to stop doing when you wake up in the morning is stop hitting the snooze, right? You have to think of it this way. If you hit the snooze, you're automatically starting your day off with a loss, right? Because when you were a fully conscious being before you went to bed, you said, you know what? I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. And then you hear the alarm clock go off. And I always say the best salesperson in the entire world is you telling yourself why you need to sleep in. That's the best salesperson in the entire world. We're all really good at sales. We're just really good salespeople for ourselves with excuses. Stop hitting the snooze button. Don't set multiple alarms. I had someone come to my event last week in person and they were like, look, I, these are my three alarms that I set for myself and the motivational thing that I put. It's great to have a motivational thing with each alarm, but why do you have three alarms in the first place? Why don't you just wake up with the first one? Wake up with your first alarm. It sets you off on the wrong foot when you have multiple alarms that you go with or when you're hitting the snooze button because your body gets all confused. Oh, am I asleep? Am I awake? Am I asleep? Am I awake? Stop hitting the snooze button. That is number two. Number three, stop looking at your phone immediately. Stop looking at your phone immediately. In fact, get an alarm. Get a real old school alarm and put it on the other side of the room. Don't put it next to your bed. It's a lot easier to not look at your phone when your phone is not your alarm. It's also a lot easier to not hit the snooze button when you don't have a snooze button that's on your phone and you immediately just walk over to the other side of the room and get that alarm and turn it off and put it on the other side of the room because it's easier to get up when you've already gotten out of bed. You have to get out of bed, you have to go get it. So stop looking at your phone, stop checking social media. Holy crap, stop checking social media. How stressful is that to do that first thing in the morning? That just sets you off down the wrong path. Stop checking your text messages. Stop checking your emails. Don't look at your phone for as long as you possibly can. If you have an hour long morning routine and your alarm goes off at six and at seven o'clock is when your morning routine ends, turn your phone off when you go to bed and do not look at your phone until after you're done with your morning routine. 
Stop looking at your phone. I promise you, it'll set your day off on such a better foot because all too often, people get their emails, they get their text messages, they get their social media notifications, and all of this anxiety floods in because you're like, holy crap, I've got so much to do and I haven't even gone to the bathroom yet. I haven't even brushed my teeth. I've got so much that I've got to do. Anxiety will just build up inside of you. Stop looking at your phone first thing in the morning. Okay, step number four. The fourth thing I want you to stop doing is stop not making your bed. Start with a win. Make your bed. It takes what, 30 seconds to make your bed? And it may not seem like a big deal. And I completely understand because for the longest time, I thought making my bed was the stupidest thing because I don't do anything else in my room except for sleep. I'm not one of those people who goes in my room and hangs out and works and does phone calls or watches TV or any of that stuff. The only thing that I do in my room is get dressed and sleep. That's the only two things that I do. I sleep first and then I get dressed. I don't get dressed and then sleep. But it may not seem like a big deal. But think about this for a second. If you wake up on your first alarm, if you don't check your phone, if you make your bed, you're starting with three wins before you even brush your teeth. Do you know how much better that makes you feel? What happens is that your brain then releases dopamine. And if you've been listening to my recent episodes, I've been talking about how dopamine is the motivational chemical inside of your brain. So your brain releases dopamine with every single win, which then makes you feel more motivated to go actually get other wins throughout the day. When you wake up and you hit your first alarm and you're, you're good, you're up. That's right there is a win. When you don't check your phone, boom, that's another win. When you make your bed, boom, that's another one. You have three wins before you ever even brush your teeth. That's dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. You feel more motivated to go do something. You're starting your day off on the right foot, going and taking the action that you need to, to go towards the life that you want to. So if you want to start your life off on the right foot, make your bed, get up on the first alarm, do whatever it is that you need to do to not check your phone. So number four is stop not making your bed. Step number five. The thing I want you to stop doing, this is going to piss a lot of people off. I've got a couple of them coming up. They're going to piss you off as well. Stop taking warm showers. There are so many benefits. I've been saying this for years when I first heard this about five years ago and I started doing cold showers. There were, there were very few benefits. It was like there's benefits to it, but there's a whole lot of pseudoscience behind it. There is so much science as to the benefits of cold showers. Just go to Google and type in benefits of cold showers. And there's so many studies that have been done recently. When you take a cold shower, number one, they suck. Number two, they never stop sucking. Number three, they never get any easier. But number four, that has to do with that, it is another win because it is so hard to not listen to that little voice inside of your head that says, hey man, just, just skip the cold shower today. No one's gonna know. But you hear that little voice inside of your head that says, don't do it. That little voice is the same little voice that says, hey, sleep in a little bit longer. Hey, don't worry about going to the gym today. Hey, eat that pizza. Don't eat the salad. It's that little voice inside of your head. I like to call it the little inner bitch. That's what I call it. It's that little inner bitch coming in and telling you not to do something. And when you can conquer that little voice inside of your head, first thing in the morning, that is your fourth win by the time you get done showering. Think about that. You have started your day off in full on intentional, proactive mode, not putting out fires, not reactive. I'm in control of my life. I'm in control of my day. I'm going to kick today's ass. That's how you're starting your day every single day. If you do this, right? I hate cold showers. I love the way it makes me feel after though. I don't like them when I'm in them. I'm never like, yay, I'm in a cold shower. Yay. I'm about to a cold shower. Don't enjoy them. Don't like them, but I do love the benefits of them. The physical benefits are great. You can Google those. I'm most interested in the mental benefits of doing what I don't want to do. Cause if I can make myself do what I don't want to do in the morning, it makes it so much easier. It's like knocking over dominoes in the morning. It's just going to continue that momentum throughout the day. So that's number five. The sixth thing I want you to stop doing is stop doing anything that is not for yourself right away. Your morning is your time. Your morning is the time for you to work on yourself, for you to improve, for you to get better. Stop working. Stop getting the kids ready. Now, I'm not, you can work later. You can get the kids ready later, but I'm talking about getting up before all of that so that you have some me time so that you can work on yourself. Because what I find with a lot of people, as we tend to get older, as people tend to have kids, is that we are a lot of times, the reason why people get so stressed out and have so much anxiety a lot of times is because they're trying to give from an empty cup. They're just giving, 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 and they're not receiving. And what I mean by receiving is waking up and filling your own cup. That's your you time. 
your time to meditate, your time to read, your time to work out, do yoga, journal, whatever it is that fills your cup, that makes you feel good, that is your you time. So stop doing things that's not for you. You have to see the morning routine, those morning times as absolutely sacred. Those are your you times. So if the kids normally wake up at seven, wake up at six, whatever it is that you got to do and plan yourself to go to bed earlier. One of the things that I love is, is a couple years ago, Mark Wahlberg, the actor, put out his morning routine and everybody was so blown away because his morning routine starts at like, I think it's like 4 a.m. Actually, I think it's like 3 a.m. if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's, I think it's, yeah, I think it's 3 a.m. At 3 a.m. is when it, when it, uh, you know, his, his morning routine starts. So he gets up at 3 a.m. and he follows this whole morning routine. And everyone's like, why would you wake up at 3 a.m.? I went to an event, I'm part of a mastermind, and he came and spoke at the mastermind and he was talking about his morning routine and how he gets up so early and everyone's like, oh my God, I can never get up that early. The secret to his morning routine is that his kids go to bed at 7.30. And so when his kids go to bed and they're asleep, he just goes to sleep right after them. And so it's like, oh my God, he wakes up so early. He also goes to bed so early. So he goes to bed at 8 a.m. Or I'm sorry, 8 p.m. So he goes to bed at 8 p.m. He wakes up at three, that's seven hours of sleep. That's what he feels like he needs. So you can wake up earlier if you just go to bed earlier. So whatever it is that you wanna create for your morning routine, whatever it is that you want it to look like, just plan ahead, just be intentional. That's all you gotta do. So that is the sixth thing to stop doing. Stop doing anything that is not for yourself right away. That's what you need to make sure. Don't do anything for anybody else. Fill your cup right away. Speaking of filling cups, number seven is stop drinking coffee right away. Oh, I told you there's going to be some that were going to piss you guys off, right? Stop drinking coffee right away. Why? There's a lot of studies that have found that you should wait at least an hour before you have any coffee. And the reason why, one of the main reasons why, is because your cortisol levels, which are your stress hormones, are at their absolute highest throughout the day when you wake up. Cortisol is usually what wakes people up. And so I don't know if you've ever, I feel it all the time. The moment that I wake up, immediately it's like flooded with stress. Five out of seven days, I get that. It's like I feel the stress immediately and it's like anxious thoughts, it's stressful thoughts. The worst thing that you could do at that time is give yourself some freaking coffee because that's just going to flood you with more stress and anxiety and get your cortisol levels to go higher. So usually what you should do is you should wait about an hour at least before you have coffee. The reason why, it allows your stress hormones to go down. It allows your body to calm down. The first thing that you should do is actually more than anything else is drink water and not drink coffee because you usually lose at least a liter of water every single day when you go to bed. Throughout your sleeping, you lose a liter of water. So what do you do? Start your day off with warm water, lemon, and sea salt. You need to hydrate more than anything else. Because if you wake up, think about this, if you, hyd if you don't hydrate, you wake up, your stress levels are at the highest that they're ever going to be throughout the day. And you add caffeine to that. And at the same time, you're drinking coffee, which is you know, dehydrating you. You're basically starting off really in a really bad position. But when you wake up, you drink a whole lot of water with lemon and sea salt in it. It allows your body to take all of that to rehydrate itself. And then about an hour later, after your cortisol levels drop, it allows your body to then be able to have the caffeine. There's a lot of studies that show, you can Google it if you want to, that if you wait an hour, the caffeine actually is much more, helps you be much more productive if you have ca caffeine an hour after you wake up versus immediately after you wake up. So the seventh thing to stop doing when you wake up in the morning, sorry everybody, stop drinking coffee. Right away, you can drink it later. And number eight, stop eating. Stop eating as soon as you wake up in the morning. Try something called intermittent fasting, uh, why is that? You guys probably know there's a million studies of it coming out with that. But if you go back and listen to my podcast, I had Dr. David Sinclair on my podcast. He is the head of Harvard's anti-aging. And uh, he says, eat one less meal per day. And so there's so many benefits of skipping a meal. And since you've already fasted for eight hours, seven, eight hours, because you were asleep for seven to eight hours. And if you don't eat for an hour or two hours before you go to bed, you're fasting, you're about a, on a 10 hour fast. Just skip your breakfast and then you can go and you can have your lunch. There's so many studies on how intermittent fasting helps you live longer, helps you be healthier, helps you obviously reduce your caloric intake. And he said one of the secrets, if you just want to live longer, just skip a meal every single day. And the easiest one to skip 
is breakfast. And what happens is if you start to read some articles and start to watch some YouTube videos on fasting, is it, it takes about three days for your body to get used to this. So if you've been eating breakfast immediately when you wake up or your body's used to it, you will feel the first three days really, really hungry. But that's the reason, the reason why is because your body releases something called, I think it's called gremin. It sounds like gremlin, whatever it is. Uh, and it releases this and that is the hunger uh, hormone that's released and the chemical that's released that tells your body when to eat. After about three days of not eating at the same time, so you decided, like, say so you decided to skip breakfast, day four, you're not really gonna want your breakfast anymore. You're not really gonna be that hungry. So I recommend, try it out, skip it. If you wanna learn more about intermittent fasting and how it helps you live longer, how it helps you be healthier, you can go back to my podcast episode with Dr. David Sinclair and you can learn about it. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you want to learn even more about mastering your mind, click right here and watch this video as well. So if you're at a job that you hate, it is a complete, absolute waste of your life. We get the feeling of this isn't what I want, but am I too far down the road to turn back now? People want it, I understand it, but most people are not willing to step out into the unknown, into what seems illogical to follow their heart.